Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. I'm Greg. I'm Pac. And I'm Milo. And we have another great episode for all of you today. Uh, Today we're doing part two of our little two-part series on sleep. Uh, And I do feel confident calling this a two-part series because looking at how much is left on the outline, if there is a third part here, we're going to have a problem. Uh, So thanks for tuning back in. Hope you enjoyed our first sleep episode. Uh, And in this one, we're going to pick up where we left off. Um, In the last episode, we talked about the impact of sleep duration and sleep consistency on things like health outcomes, mortality, uh, weight regulation, etc. And in this one, we are picking up talking about the impact of sleep and sleep interventions on exercise performance uh, and, and lifting and some sleep interventions that may improve exercise performance, even if you already sleep fairly well. Uh, We're going to talk about napping a little bit, um, and we're going to talk a bit about uh, all of of the stuff we discussed in the last episode. You know, if you don't sleep well, there are some negative ramifications that come along with that. So we ask, hey, what can you do to, uh, to mitigate some of the downsides of not sleeping well or not sleeping much if that's something you struggle with? Uh, so that is what we have on the agenda for this episode. Um, but yeah, be- before we before we dive in, uh, how, how's it going, guys? Any anything on your mind or any uh, any feedback to the first episode you want to discuss or or anything like that? I want to apologize to those that may be more on the OCD side of things with how we introduce ourselves every time we start an episode. Last time we included our surnames, uh, this time we didn't, and I think there's been some inconsistency with that, so I apologize. But as far as the previous episode goes, um, there were quite a few people that were like, oh, this was great from a... um, taking away the nocebo effect that sometimes comes with, you know, articles on sleep and sleep duration specifically, because they were like, oh, it turns out that if I do have the odd night here and there where I'm sleeping five or six hours, it's not the end of the world and I am not going to die. So, so, so that was great. Other than that, um, positive feedback, five stars, the usual SBS podcast way. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I agree. And as a former chronic insomniac, that is the vibe I came away with during this last episode is when you have poor sleep, you always want to know, okay, how much damage am I really causing here health-wise and gains-wise as far as the gym goes? Um, And yeah, it was just good to see that the research on the whole, unless you're chronically undersleeping by a large amount or you have wildly irregular... um, sleep wake patterns for like five to ten years plus in a row your health doesn't seem to be too negatively impacted um and in this episode we'll get into what the ramifications of sleep are for lifting so hopefully we can have a similarly positive and comforting takeaway but let's see yeah i i think i think people will be will be heartened by it um much like the much like the health and longevity stuff i think a lot of people anticipate that the negative impacts of sleep on athletic performance are considerably larger than the research actually supports. Um, so yeah, that, that'll be good to discuss. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, I uh, need to go through some of our standard top of the episode plugs, and then we're going to get into the content. Uh, so if you like the show, and if you're listening to this episode, I assume you do. You listen to the first part on sleep and said, Dang, I liked this enough that I want to tune in for more. Uh, so if that describes you, um, please like, rate, and subscribe. Tell your friends about the podcast. Uh, it really does help us out. If you're interested in hiring a virtual coach to help you with your training and or nutrition, Stronger by Science has a team of excellent coaches that can help you out. You can learn more about that at strongerbyscience.com coaching. Uh, if you want to purchase supplements at a great price, uh, even even better than it would be before because you get a, a little discount, uh, head over to BalkSupplements.com and use code SBSPOD at checkout for a 5% discount. 
If you want to stay up to date on all of the goings on in the Stronger by Science uh, extended universe, make sure to join our Facebook group and or subreddit. That's Stronger by Science community on Facebook and uh, reddit.com slash r slash Stronger by Science. Um, if you want to stay even more up to date and in touch with us, check out our newsletter. Uh, we send you high quality informative content, not just not just spamming you, trying to sell you a bunch of bullshit. Uh, and you can check out that newsletter at strongerbyscience.com slash newsletter. Uh, I think, well, as we record this, our next newsletter topic is about uh, caffeine and health. I think by the time people would be listening to this, our previous newsletter topic was about caffeine and health. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's good stuff coming out there. So check out the newsletter. Uh, and finally, if you have questions that you would like us to answer on the pod, uh, you can record a voice clip, uh, 60 seconds or less and email it to podcast at stronger by Uh, so with that out of the way, uh, let's get into it. The first thing we're talking about uh, on this episode is the effects of uh, inadequate sleep on resistance training and general athletic performance. Um, so what one of you guys is up. Take it away. We're taking it away with the uh, classic. I'm not sure if it's a classic paper with a, with a paper from 2022 by uh, Craven et al. titled Effects of Acute Sleep Loss on Physical Performance, a Systematic and Meta-Analytical Review. Um, where essentially they looked at studies where uh, it, they included studies essentially if they investigated the effects of uh, acute sleep loss, so less or equal to six hours of sleep, on physical exercise performance in healthy adults. Uh, essentially, they, they looked at exercise tasks that were then categorized into seven types. They looked at anaerobic power. They looked at speed and power endurance, high-intensity interval exercise, strength, endurance, strength, endurance, and skill. And we'll get to what that means in a second. And they essentially looked at and analyzed the effects of sleep loss uh, across these categories. The results, they um, actually included data from 69 uh, publications, which resulted in 85 trials with 227 outcome measures, again, across all these various exercise categories, making it in their analysis. And overall, spoiler alert, acute sleep loss negatively impacted exercise performance across all categories, with uh, skill tasks being the most affected. However, the pattern of sleep loss was something that seemed to matter quite a bit. Um, more specifically, sleep deprivation and late restriction, which essentially means uh, you know going to bed uh, late and waking up early, those had uh, more substantial uh, impacts on performance than early restriction. Additionally, the timing of exercise uh, after sleep loss also influenced performance. So with tasks that were performed in the PM more, uh, were, the, were more adversely affected than those that were performed in the AM. And based on the author's analysis, for every hour awake before an exercise task, performance declined by approximately 0.4%. Which then led them to conclude that when avoidable, mimicking uh, early restriction sleep patterns and prioritizing morning exercise may help maintain performance. However, the authors obviously also highlighted the need for future research, more specifically research on sleep quality and whether that impacts uh, performance, fragmented sleep, and the impact of sleep loss on evening exercise, as well as its effect on combined physical and, co and cognitive tasks that may be relevant to team sports. So, however, um, the, they did make a call for more research involving female participants, which is something that we see quite a bit in our, in our field. Um, and uh, as well as exploring the influence uh, of a participant's training status on performance. Yeah, so one thing that struck me about the results here is that, and I think this is consistent across a few papers that we have in the outline here, we're not going to mention every single one because some of them do overlap because they're review papers, um, but for example, a previous paper by Knowles and colleagues also found a similar thing titled Inadequate Sleep and Muscle Strength 
implications for resistance training. But one thing that struck me that was consistent across both these papers was that generally training or exercising sooner after sleep restriction is better than later after sleep restriction. So if you didn't sleep well, training in the morning might be better than training in the evening if you're unable to get some sleep or nap during the day. Um, which kind of pairs well with what I personally find to be one of the better strategies for training when I'm sleep deprived or haven't slept very well, which is caffeine use. I think that if you train in the morning after a relatively bad night of sleep and use some caffeine, in my experience at least, sessions can go a little bit better than they otherwise would. And based on this data, it might be worth training in the morning if you have the choice and maybe using some caffeine as well, provided you don't take it too close to sleep. As I'm aware of one meta-analysis that was recently conducted by Gardner and colleagues um, on the effect of caffeine supplementation or caffeine consumption on sleep. And essentially, caffeine can have potential ramifications for sleep even as late as 12 to 13 hours later if the caffeine dose is large enough of about two to 300 milligrams of caffeine. So I would typically restrict caffeine use for relatively early in the day when it comes to sleep, especially if they're you're going to be using relatively large doses, say in excess of about 200 milligrams or so. Um, but, it, you know, based on this review paper, it just strikes me that using some caffeine when you do get up and wake up relatively early after a bad night of sleep might be a good way to circumvent some of these issues. What do you yeah. think? Um, yeah, sure. For, for sure. I I definitely agree with those uh, with those strategies, especially... Um, especially, you know, if you're somebody who is used to, um, training earlier in the day, that may be even less of a, of an effect observed there. It's also important to note that they looked at specific, they looked specifically at studies where people slept six hours or less. And although performance decreases were observed across the board, and in some cases there were statistically meaningful, um, some of those decreases may not actually represent a meaningful decrease in performance. And they may be even regarded as like a uh, normal fluctuation in performance. So I, just just because they found that overall eh, sleeping six hours or less is a, um, is associated with a decrease in performance, I wouldn't take that to to mean that oh, if you sleep five hours and forty five minutes that one day, you're all of a sudden going to be doomed when it comes to the gym, especially if you follow some of uh, what Milo just said. Yeah, one of one of the um, I'll, I'll be. I'll be honest, I did not uh, reread this meta-analysis before we recorded this episode, um, but I did read it, and if memory serves, I think I wrote about this for Mass a few years ago, so I I think I remember it, but eh, whatever. If if I get something wrong, listeners can correct me. Um, but yeah, like the the findings related to like specific exercise outcomes um, suggested that like maximal strength performance really isn't affected that much at all. Um, and in a lot of studies isn't affected at all. Um, the thing that does seem to be more impacted is like strength endurance or like volume performance for an entire lifting session. Uh, I, I can't remember the author, but there was, there was a paper on like Olympic lifters from maybe like 2012, 2013, um, that, that looked at that. And, that, that was the study that, if memory serves, has reported kind of like the largest uh, effect sizes for actual kind of like strength training related variables. Um, and yeah, it, it was looking at volume performed during an entire standardized lifting session. So yeah, if, if you're um, if you have one night of just like really poor sleep, either just not sleeping much, like not spending much time in bed or tossing and turning all night um, and you're thinking Hey, do I need to modify my workout because of this? Um, I do think a case could be made that both in terms of how your performance is kind of naturally going to be affected by the poor sleep and, you know, the your, your ability to kind of like maybe adapt to training or just kind of like, you know, maybe not wanting to to heap another large stressor on. Yeah, it might behoove you to reduce training volume a little bit because that does seem to be the thing that sleep is going to impact the most anyways. Um, but if you, if you had heavy training planned, you can probably go, go along with it. Um, and it probably isn't going to be affected maybe any at all. And certainly not 
nearly as much as I think a lot of people would expect it to be. Um, anecdotally, uh, I, I was about to say I hit my best numbers after like bad nights of sleep. Um, like v- very reliably. So all of my all time PR lifts were done on four hours of sleep or less. Um, and part, part of that <laughs> was I would be going into the gym saying like, yeah, I didn't sleep much at all last night. I'm not going to be cranking out the volume today. I'm just going to get in, do something heavy, maybe a couple drop back sets and call it a day. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of gave myself license to really, really go pedal to the metal on my heavy stuff because I knew I didn't really need to worry as much about what was coming next in my workout. Um, but I, I also personally felt like after only getting like two or three hours of sleep, yeah, like I'm going to fatigue faster during a workout. But like early on, I felt like I had this kind of like tingly, like nervous energy that um, was like beneficial for just just ripping a one rep max. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, not not all types of uh, athletic performance are affected equitably by short sleep um, and and maximal strength tends to hold up pretty well. Yeah, I, I have the exact same experience with PRs and and poor sleep the night before where there is this. I'm not sure how how to explain it, but very much like with you, this sort of nervousness uh, coupled up with the with the high dose of caffeine that usually accompanies those sessions always resulted in in a uh, in great 1RM strength performance at least but anecdotally as well i i don't think it's uncommon for elite athletes or at least competitive athletes to not get the best sleep before a competitive event although don't quote me on that cuz that's just mostly my observation from powerlifters and stuff so just to double down on your not entirely researched anecdotal take i do think there is some research and this is not my expertise around sort of cognitive arousal and anxiety leading up to different competitions. And generally, that kind of gradually increases over a few weeks leading up to competition in most sports and peaks in the few nights before the competition, which generally is also when people sleep the worst, Um, which makes sense. But one thing I will go against that you just both mentioned, maybe not against, but kind of um, give my own two cents on, is I do think with acute sleep restriction or sleep deprivation performance in my experience is pretty solid um maybe just kind of coinciding with how hyped you are for an event or how anxious which kind of go go hand in hand all the time um and in fact one thing i do remember from research on sports psychology is that generally um pre-performance or pre-competition anxiety is generally interpreted more favorably as excitement by more successful competitors and generally interpreted more as anxiety and detrimental by more uh, by lesser performing competitors um, but one thing I did notice with chronic sleep restriction on the other hand is that when I was a chronic insomniac yeah my uh, my performance at least did not feel great like I, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't tell you if Milo B in a parallel universe who was not suffering from chronic insomnia but everything else was equated for I couldn't tell you that he would have made a ton more gains but at the very least as far as how it feels, I, I do think sleep can make a pretty big impact on how training sessions feel. And oftentimes it was a battle of, all right, this feels like crap, but it is still good to train, even though my sleep might not be great. Because as it turns out, sleep has me- well, exercise many benefits that then can foster good sleep in the future, for example. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Yeah, the I, I, sh- I, should, have, uh, I should have added that bit of nuance. I was talking about like one night of poor sleep. Yeah, like back to back to back to back to back nights of poor sleep. Um, this this is very anecdotal uh, as well. And like we mentioned in the last episode, um, most like most of the things we have data on related to sleep are either like if they're trying to make inferences about like long term outcomes, you're mostly dealing with like cross sectional kind of survey type research. Um, and if you're dealing with like intervention studies, most of them are very short term. So most of the studies looking at the impact of sleep restriction or sleep deprivation on athletic performance, they're like one night. Um, there are a couple 
uh, there like there are a couple studies that run a few days, but you know we're not dealing with with interventions where people are getting experimentally restricted sleep for weeks at a time. So when it comes to discussing like, hey, how much does two nights of sleep restriction affect you versus one versus five versus ten? Um, yeah, a, a lot of those inferences I think do kind of like necessarily have to come from anecdote um, just because we don't have a ton of data on it. Uh, but yeah, my, my experience is my experience matches yours, Milo, like one night of bad sleep. I can power through, not going to do a ton of volume. Max strength is fine. Two nights. Now it's getting a little dodgy. Once I, once I'm looking at like a Friday lifting session after a full work week of bad sleep. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm not feeling good. I'm generally not performing well across the board. So, yeah, I, I do think that the the negative impacts on acute performance do accumulate over time. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And if nothing else, some of my worst feeling sessions where I just feel most achy and the session doesn't feel great and what have you is generally just when my sleep is the worst consistently. Um, so yeah, I I don't think we'll review the evidence on this topic in this episode, but I do think there is some evidence around how sleep impacts your mood states and all that, and that can certainly play a role with how you um, perceive a session. People are losing sure. their minds now, taking out their notebooks and then running to be like, wait a second, chronic sleep deprivation affects our performance. So, ah, everything we knew is a lie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh- Okay, I, I think I think we maybe move along to the next topic because <laughs> I don't think we're breaking any new grounds here. I think most people listening to this already knew that sleep deprivation wasn't great for athletic performance, uh, or if they didn't know it, they at least strongly suspected it. That's that's a pretty intuitive thing. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the other side of the coin. Yes, if you take people who do already get a pretty reasonable amount of sleep, and you say, hey, why don't you try sleeping quite a bit more? Uh, What happens there? Like, how how does that affect athletic performance? For sure. And for that, we have a 2021 systematic review by Silva et al. uh, called Sleep Extension in Athletes, What We Know So Far. A systematic review. And essentially, the authors here included studies uh, investigating sleep extension and its effects on athletes' uh, sport performance. They ended up including just seven studies uh, that covered a variety of sports, namely basketball, tennis, soccer, football, cycling, triathlon, pistol and rifle shooting, football, rugby, and handball. Fun fact, the Greek Olympian who won a gold medal for shooting in the Olympics has my one of my last names. And yeah, people ask me if I'm related to her. I am not. Uh, and participants were primarily, again, males, um, uh, male athletes aged 14 to 30. Now, sleep was extended to approximately 9 to 10 hours over 1 to 49 days, obviously depending on the study, for athletes who habitually slept somewhere between 6 to 9 hours a day. So already we're looking at athletes that slept more than the, the the previous the previous systematic review that we looked at, uh, where they looked at deprivation, and overall, um, with the exception of uh, a couple of studies, everybody managed to extend their sleep. Now there were two studies that were included: one by Fulagar et al. from 2016, and one by Supia et al. from 2016, where. Um, they actually noticed uh, a decrease in sleep in the intervention groups, and that was um, that happened because the, the the participants we were elite athletes that had um, some form of uh, competitive travel schedule. So in Supia et al, for example, sl- sleep duration decreased due to the stress and demands associated with international cricket hours, but overall. They, the authors of the systematic review observed that sleep, uh, sleep extension uh, varied, but 
on average led to an increase in sleep duration. Uh, performance measures also varied, uh, obviously depending, uh, obviously because of all the different sports that were included, uh, with some studies showing improvements post sleep extension. Now, when they looked even closer, the analysis of sleep extension and its effects showed uh, a, a relatively broad range from trivial effects to large effects with significant performance improvements in some studies, but not others. And there was, um, you know, a, a variation of methodological quality as well as risk of bias across different studies. Now, I've made a note on the studies that did see uh, a large uh, effect in terms of improvement. So my et al, so a large effect of improvement in uh, 282 feet sprint and free throws. Now, there was a couple more studies, one by Roberts et al, where uh, time trial um, also experienced not a large uh, effect, but a medium one, and by a study by Bookers et al, where there was um, a moderate effect, small to moderate actually, in my maximal uh, voluntary isometric contraction. And yeah, we're not going to now, I don't think it makes sense to look at each specific study uh, individually and go over what they what they saw. But the effectiveness of sleep extension for improving athletic performance remains somewhat unclear due to methodological issues in the studies, uh, such as in, inadequate assessment of um, the athlete's habitual sleep patterns and uh, obviously the lack of the uh, lack of consideration for the athlete's chronotypes. So the authors also noted that the benefits of sleep extension noted in some of the studies should be interpreted with uh, with caution and that future research should more accurately assess uh, sleep patterns, consider chronotypes and evaluate extensions, um, the, the effect of the of uh, sleep extension in real life competitive settings. So as it stands, based on just this systematic review, and we have more, uh, more evidence to look at, things were unclear when the good people over at the, whichever university Silva et al comes from uh, looked at the literature. That would be Liverpool Moores University, I think. John hey, Moores, actually. Yeah. I had applied In there. The UK. Hey, there you go. Um, a couple things did strike me from this. One is, although the improvements in performance are relatively inconsistent, so some studies essentially didn't really find an improvement in performance, where the effect size seen was very, very small. Um, Pretty much all changes leaned in favor of, well, pretty much all of the changes were positive, which in the absence of, I'm guessing some studies didn't have control groups, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in the absence of control group, doesn't really tell you much because all it's telling you is they trained, slept a little bit more, and improved. It's hard to tell whether it's just the fact that they trained or also the fact that they slept a bit more than before. Um, or, or just practicing the test. Because, I mean, s yeah. some of these things like... Um, uh, I don't know. And I, I apologize for cutting you off. Realize I'm doing it, but my bad, whatever. Um, <laughs> some, some, some of these things, though, some of these things I don't think you necessarily need a control group for. Like, just, just to point this out, um, like the, the first sleep extension study by Ma and colleagues was in uh, collegiate, I, I think, Division One basketball players, like people who've played a lot of basketball. Um, and they reported an 11.4% improvement in free throw shooting accuracy, which, you know, it's not like the, these guys had never practiced free throws and then they just started practicing free throws for three weeks and got 11, 12% better at them. Um, you know, I, I, and that's also not a, oh, you're practicing the test for the first time type of deal. Like, I, I think... I think when you're seeing that ki that kind of improvement, um, it would still be nice to see a control group, absolutely for sure. But I think you can, um, I, I think you can make some like moderately confident inferences about that being a true improvement without it. Um, but for some of the other things, like uh, studies reporting um, changes in like. Uh, the yo-yo intermittent recovery test to distance or whatever. A lot of people have never done the yo-yo test and a lot of people that have uh, ha haven't done it since like elementary school. So, you know, it, that could be changes there might be due to sleep extension. They might just be due to, hey, you had previously had no reps of the yo-yo test. 
and now you've done it once. And so the second time you you perform better regardless. Um, so yeah, yeah. Just, just wanted to point that out. Like the, the lack of control group is a larger or smaller drawback depending on the, the type of test performed in, in these athletes. Yeah, no, I, I do agree for sure. And I think one thing you see across the studies and I could just be over reading into them now, but is that the improvements tend to be larger in things that are a bit more technical in nature. So for yes. example, a study by Petit et al, which literally means small in French, by the way, uh, like it's spelled perfectly and it just means small. Um, from 2014, looked at Wingate peak power and Wingate mean power um, outcomes. And to give you an idea of what that is, it is essentially a 30 second all out sprint on a traditionally Wingate bike or an indoor bike where you're measuring power output and you're measuring drop off as well. So what's your sort of peak power that you reach and how much does it drop off over three seconds? And in this case, for example, they noticed essentially no difference. Uh, they saw a plus 0.6 to 0.9% change from before to after in peak power and mean power respectively. Um, so we're talking about a very small difference and that kind of reflects some of the data, the data on resistance training where generally the negative impact of sleep deprivation on lifting performance seems to be largest for more technical or compound movements versus more strictly strength-based tests. And so it seems that generally, if your sport involves more of a technical component uh, versus less of one, you may see a larger improvement from sleep extension or a larger um, worsening of your performance with sleep restriction or deprivation, what have you. That's kind of my general takeaway from this uh, is that it's probably not going to hurt you to sleep a bit more. And for more technical things, it is likely to play a larger role. So I did have one more thing I wanted to say about for sleep sure. extension. Um, this was one of the bodies of literature I, I had in mind, but didn't want to spoil when um, when we were discussing the the longevity and, and mortality stuff in the last episode where if you look at epidemiological research, you see that people that sleep a long time uh, have higher rates of all-cause mortality. Um, but like we talked about in the last episode, you can't necessarily uh, infer causation from that. And a lot of those studies were in older adults who, who tend to naturally sleep a little bit less. Um, in these sleep extension studies in younger athletes, you're dealing i mean most most of these are in are in collegiate athletes so people who are al already young and therefore capable of sleeping more i know i know a couple of them were in adult athletes like in their 30s but a lot of the like most of the studies here are on college kids um and in that context you know you're not expecting any significant mortality rates <laughs> in that population in the first place but I think there is sometimes the um, the the assumption that just if you see uh, you know something being associated with mortality, you just kind of like slot that in your mind as like this thing is bad, whatever. Like it it does negative things, um, and you know in an experimental setting in a separate population. People who were typically sleeping somewhere in the neighborhood of like seven hours per night, it seems like getting nine to 10 hours of sleep instead of like seven ish uh, across the board had a neutral to positive effect on um, all facets of athletic performance that were that were assessed. So just kind of like, you know, we like we discussed in the last episode, um, yeah, you shouldn't necessarily draw causal inferences from uh, cross-sectional epidemiological data um, or generalize too much to other populations. Uh, I know that there are a lot of people, like, like you guys alluded to at the top of the episode, there are a lot of people who are concerned uh, that if they're not sleeping enough, that the wheels are really going to fall off and really bad things are going to happen. Um, but I do also frequently see people concerned thinking like, oh man, like when I ramp my training up really, really hard um, and I don't have to wake up to an alarm, my body just naturally seems to want nine to 10 hours of sleep. But I've looked at some of these mortality meta-analyses and like 
is it, is it bad for me to sleep that much? Like if, if I give my body the amount of sleep it wants when I'm training really hard, is that bad for me? And I just so strongly think that it is not like that. That is that is good. Like if if your body is asking for more sleep and you're already sleeping eight hours per night and you have time and space in your schedule to get an extra hour of sleep, um, I just so, so strongly believe that that is not going to be bad for you. Uh, in fact, I think it'll be good for you. And you shouldn't necessarily draw inferences from the mortality data on older adults and apply it to yourself, a young, healthy athlete who wants to get nine hours of sleep instead of eight. Yeah, definitely agree. Okay. And Milo, Milo has been a, an avid sleep, not extension, but like nine to 10 hour sleep enjoyer or aimer for to to put it better right? yeah like consistently my aim is to be in bed for at least nine hours um now in my case it is partly uh medicated or chemically induced mm -hmm. um so one of the medications i'm on is called mirtazapine has a sedative effect and so i think like it's difficult to say with certain in certain contexts like if you're using certain medications that make you sedated or groggy or what have you um whether or not that additional sleep is going to hurt you or benefit you, like if you're already at a good state. Um, but certainly in my case, I've just found that, hey, I want to sleep more. So if I can, I will sleep more. I'm not sure it's benefiting me past nine hours of sleep already. But um, yeah, in some cases, it's a bit more tricky to know how much should you actually be sleeping. But I think if you're in the, in the right ballpark and you're feeling pretty good, yeah, you're probably fine. I've... Uh I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but the the period of time in my lifting career when I made the best gains like outside of the newbie stage was a time that I was sleeping like 11 hours a night. Um, I was I was working at a gym and um, like it, it was like a group training thing. Like most of the athletes came in at like three, four p.m. and they were mostly gone by like six. So. Yeah, I was I was doing like other things for the gym and whatnot, but the actual coaching, like the like where where my my physical body needed to be in a physical space for a particular period of time, it was like three hours a day, very chill job, um, and I had twenty one hours to do whatever else I wanted to, and I spent a very good chunk of those hours training a lot and sleeping a lot, like I was I was training like an out an average of like four hours a day. And I was sleeping an average of like 11 hours a night. And I got to tell you, lads, it was fucking great. Um, and I took my total from like 15.25 to 17.14 in like 10 weeks. <laughs> it, was, wow. it was so sick. Um, and it's not just for, for an anecdote of someone who is far more successful than me in sports. Uh, from from y'all, from uh, your, your guys' side of the pond, uh, Paula Radcliffe, the ex world record holder in the in uh, women's marathon, ran like a, a two hour, 15 minute time, I believe, which I think that's been beaten. But it was like I think it was pretty comfortably best in the world when she did it. Um, she quite famously sleeps like a cat, uh, like during her competitive career. She said that she averaged about 11 hours of sleep per day. And in her more intense training training blocks in the lead up to a big race, she would get up to 13 hours of sleep per night, um, which is that's a lot like you're you're spending more than half of your day sleeping at that point. Um, but it it really seemed to work out for her. Um, and from like another another anecdote from uh, from sports on my side of the pond. Um, one of the things I remember there being some some writing about at the time when the uh, Golden State Warriors dynasty was can you really call it a dynasty? There, there no. were some ups and downs. I feel like you can. I feel like you can. A dynasty. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean they uh, they had they had their championship. Then they had their seventy three win season. Then it, then they got a couple more with Durant. Yeah, I think I think three championships in a five year span. I think that counts as a dynasty. Whatever. Um, 
But yeah, once they added Kevin Durant, that team was just <laughs> entirely unfair. It was, it was ludicrous. Yeah. Uh, but like 2014, 2015, when they uh, when they were on their way up. Um, and, you know, it's it's hard to know how much, you know, things that people write about in, in the sports press. It's hard to know how much all of those things actually matter or if people are just looking for an angle of like, hey, here's one weird trick that people did to be successful when... In actuality, it was a lot of different things and Steph Curry just being an absolute fucking monster. Um, but one of the things that that they were writing about at the time was that uh, their approach to sleep was apparently fairly radical. So one of the things about the NBA is that it has, I think, the most brutal travel schedule of any professional sport uh, on the planet because you're playing 82 games, which is a lot of games and you're flying everywhere all the time. America is a big country. You're going back and forth, East coast, West coast, changing time zones. Um, and, uh, like you play more games in baseball, but you know, you fly to a city, play like four games there and go somewhere else. So it, it ends up being more travel for basketball. Um, and so a thing that a lot of teams dealt with is you'd play a game and say, San Francisco, and then you'd have a game the next night in New York. Um, and what most teams tended to do was you would get done with the game, you'd have the team playing waiting for you, and you'd take off and fly to New York and try to get some sleep on the plane, maybe try to get a little bit of sleep through the early part of the day, and then you get going in the afternoon, start warming up, play a game that night. Um and one of the things that the Warriors were, I think, the first to implement very consistently was sleeping in the place where they just played a game and flying out the next morning. And according to their like team trainers and whatnot, that had just an absolutely enormous effect on how much the players were actually sleeping nights after games. Um, and that it that, that it had like a. That, that that had a non-trivial uh, contribution towards the development of their winning ways. And as I understand it, you know, it, it wasn't just like a little anecdote that some sports writer wrote about and ultimately seemed to be fairly unimportant. Um, I think most teams do that now, which kind of gives lends some real world credence to its to its efficacy. Like it wasn't just something that one team tried out for one season and it never really caught on. Like they tried it out, word got out, other teams tried it out, and it was a pretty consistent experience of teams being like, "Oh yeah, like this, this does actually seem to be quite good. Let's let's stick with it." So, um, yeah, just just some some sleep related anecdotes in athletes where sleeping more seemed to seem to help people out. So, on the note of you getting your best gains when you were sleeping eleven hours a day. This is a honest question. Do you find there's any two-way causality to an extent where the more you train, generally I find that my oh, yeah. perceived need for sleep increases? I don't know. Is that just me or do you think that's a generalizable thing? I no, I I absolutely think that's generalizable. Um Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I'm not training as hard, uh I wake up after like either seven and a half hours or nine hours. Like I, I get either five or slick six sleep cycles in and I'm, I'm great. And I have no, no feeling or need or desire to sleep more. But when, when I'm getting, when I'm really getting after it, my body is, is calling out for either one or two additional sleep cycles for sure. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I always yeah. thought that was the case, but I wasn't sure if it was just my own experience versus just something um, generalizable. I haven't seen any evidence to that effect, so I was curious as to whether we could substantiate it with other people. Yeah, I I don't think there's research on that in particular, but um, I think it's. Yeah, it's, I mean it. It feels intuitive to me. <laughs> like, and and back in the day, I think it's also the lack of stress, right? Like, because I can imagine, say, same as with me at. Uh, uh, during my undergrad, it was all like ah, some part-time job, a few hours per week, but it was all like lifting, sleeping, and it was all done, you know, under certain substances. 
back in the back in the university days that made sleep longer and uh, more sound. And I remember, but I remember also stress being so low where like the to-do list for two months was literally like a single page on a Word document, you know? Anywho's. I never had that experience, but... Uh, Were you stressed that sounds like, Did that, you sounds, have- that sounds like a great college experience. No, I, I just never, I never uh, had that light of a course load in college. Because um, I, I started with history which ah, okay. hi- history if people don't know that is a major i th- i honestly think that that was more beneficial for me than uh the exercise science degree i ended up getting um because yeah like you you learn stuff in your ex phys classes it's like directly applicable but like you could read textbooks and learn that in, on, on your own time like i, I don't want to say it wasn't valuable but what i got out of history is History classes, what what it is, is like you go to a lecture and then at the end of the lecture, your teacher is like, hey, I need you to read these three books and write a 15 page paper about it. It's due uh, end of week. Have fun. And you go to four history classes and they're all giving like crazy assignments like that. And so it teaches um, like very diligent like research and writing practices. Um, and I like that, that, that I think has helped me more than more than anything else. But yeah, so that, that was very, that was a very intensive academic time. That was my first two years of college. And then, uh, once I switched to exercise science, I needed to do an entire other degree program in two years instead of four. So, uh, the exercise science classes were absolutely way easier and way less work intensive uh but i had to take like twice as many of them per semester so um yeah yeah i i never got the experience of just having like a super chill college semester where i didn't have that much work but it does sound very nice that does sound fun i I tend to think it's a british thing a little bit right maybe it isn't but like in the uk i went to a Maybe it's a sports science thing, to be honest. I mean, sports science isn't known for being the most rigorous field ever. Um, but when I went to Loughborough University, which is considered like one of the better sports science programs in the world for my undergrad, um, like you could comfortably get some of the best grades working a total of 10 hours a week, you know, like 10, 15 mm-hmm. hours. And that's including going to lectures. So you really like... At the time, because I wasn't really interested, uh, I didn't do more than about five to ten percent of maybe all readings that we had, we were supposed to do, and I was still fine. So, I think it maybe depends on your uh, location and the program you're running with as well. Yeah, yeah. Like, I it, go ahead. No, because in the UK also there is this term that um, this slight term and condition that your first year in your undergrad doesn't count towards your final grade. So, and the pass pass mark is forty percent. There's in most programs there's no there's no required um, like there's no ma- like attendance uh, cr- um, requirements. Reasons. They don't check so, even. So you could like obviously like they will email you and they'll be like hey you know Pac or Milo you you haven't been to class and blah 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 uh, but as long as you're handing in your assignments the first year you can you can pretty much yolo let alone if like if you're doing a sports science degree and Milo did go to like the well, I think like top five universities in the world right yeah it, by some rankings it's literally been the top university in the world for sports science like five years in a row so yeah holy shit but supposedly I, good. I think there are like some degrees, maybe like law or some some exceptions to to that rule. But in general, UK first year at university, it's it's like a especially if you've gotten like a like a life sort of bursary from the government and your student loan, which is different to student loans in the US, mind you, it's it's much much more chilled here. You, it's it's like a like a learning holiday. <laughs> my, my my first thought when you said that was like. That sounds mental, and I wonder if if British university students are just hashtag built different. Because my first thought was like, if that's how American universities worked, like everyone their freshman year would just like get alcohol poisoning and die. Like, yeah, that's what happens here. That's what happens. <laughs> enough, <here. laughs> en- enough of that happens. Yeah, with with the current academic setup. But then I was thinking about it, and like, 
I actually, I actually think that's good. I think that's a good thing because like the, the number, so, um, I don't know, like the, 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 the place I come from, uh, wasn't like super well off. And there, there were a lot of people I was friends with who were like first generation college attendees, like first, even first generation high school graduates. Um, like that wasn't uncommon. And the, the people I knew whose like parents went to college, they were prepared by their parents. They like, they were told what to expect. Most of them, they transitioned from high school to college and they were fine. Um, a lot of a lot of the people who didn't kind of like have that generation to generation um, transmission of just like, hey, here's what to expect in college. Um, here's yeah, y- y- you know what I'm talking about. Like you're they they were less prepared, not because they were less capable of collegiate coursework, but just they they didn't have that generation to generation like social transmission of of expectations about this thing that they're entering. Um a lot of them like really, really struggled in their first year of college. Um, just there, there were so many just like unknowns and things that they were unprepared for. And second year, like once they had a year of experience under their belt, they figured it out and their last three years of college were good. But, uh, oftentimes they either graduated with like a way lower GPA because they really struggled that first year or in some cases they were there on academic scholarships cuz bright folks like they they were good at the academics but just the the transition was rough and then their GPA dropped too low their freshman year they lost their scholarship and then uh some of them had to drop out some of them had to do like a year in community college and then transfer back somewhere so yeah i do think i do think maybe like having a first year of college that's basically a mulligan would would help kind of like level that playing field quite a bit and be be pretty helpful to a lot of people. To tie it all in, I do agree with that. And specifically during my first year of university, it was a blessing that there was a sort of grace or mulligan, as you put it, um, because I was having sleep issues. And so mm-hmm. it was difficult to attend lectures, let alone care too much about doing well at tests and all that. And so having that, oh, as long as you have 40% on your grade, it doesn't actually impact your final grade and therefore your prospects for future higher education or jobs, what have you. Um, So I do think it's it's helpful in in the transition. As you mentioned, I at least found it very, um, very good. I I think it may be helpful for those edge cases, but I'm not sure if categorically it's uh, a good thing because then you do see many first year students potentially not really caring as much as maybe they should. But I do agree with that. Yeah. Plus, look, like the, the, the fees over at U.S. universities, you better not be skipping classes. I'm not paying uh, seven figures for my kid to go to college to be skipping. And in the U.K., like especially back in the day, like you, you're talking about 10K um, for three years for an undergrad degree. Um, mm-hmm. Which obviously now those prices are have tripled or something, but that's also very different to US and UK and the way student loans work. Like uh, after thirty years, the loan is uh, um, is essentially uh, forgotten, and also it depends on your income. Uh, if if you're gonna be paying it back, how fast? Like it's it's much more flexible. But mm-hmm. yeah, I agree with Milo. I do think that for some people, myself included, like I was on it the first year. I didn't, my grades were, were solid, but I did have a lot of classmates that developed the worst habits and then eventually dropped out, you know, a uh, the, the couple of years later. Cause then it intensifies. Then you go to the second year and people are like, okay, like th- this counts towards the end of the degree. You can't be, you know, scoring 40% and failing assignments and stuff. Speaking yeah. of assignments, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Now let's <laughs> let's transition. We, we've look. I knew how long the outline for this episode was, and we've gotten good we feedback on the episodes being two plus hours long. So, eh, need need to work some pat. That was not that was not intentional. That was not intentional. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's let's keep let's keep moving along. So. We, um, obviously, aside from just pure, uh, pure, aside from just extending sleep, there's uh, other sleep interventions that can be implemented when looking to uh, improve athletic performance. And that's exactly what this systematic review by Kanha Kunha 
Cunha, a um, tout from 2023, looked at. The review was titled The Impact of Sleep Interventions on Athletic Performance, a systematic review. And the they essentially included uh, studies that involved athletes and sleep improvement strategies uh, and assessed uh, physical and cognitive performance outcomes. So not just a sleep extension. We were going to get to the, the exact interventions in a second. But the included studies were... 25 versus the seven that we looked at before with just sleep extension. And they looked at 17 dif different sports, uh, which I will list now. Basketball, tennis, soccer, Australian football, rugby, handball, karate, track and field, pistol and rifle shooting, cycling, triathlon, water polo, softball, judo, running, and swimming. And there's one missing, but hey-ho, 16 of them were listed. And participants range from recreationally trained to actually world-class athletes, which was very interesting. And the interventions, the sleep interventions, included things like improving sleep hygiene, napping, sleep extension, obviously, removing electronic devices, light interventions, uh, cold water immersion, and also mindfulness. And overall, sleep extension and napping were found to be the most beneficial for improving sleep uh, and then subsequently improving physical or cognitive performance. And the most uh, improvement in, in physical performances specifically was observed in activities, as uh, Greg actually mentioned before, requiring endurance, uh, sprinting, uh, accuracy, serving accuracy, uh, and even maximal strength. As far as cognitive performance outcomes, improving, improvements were primarily seen uh, in attention and reaction time, as well as uh, psychomotor vigilance. I've noted all the specific effect sizes for all those outcomes, and we can potentially go over them later. But for the time being, um, I just want to wrap this, this quick overview up with... The effect of other interventions like sleep hygiene, uh, electronic device removal, and so on and so forth had mixed evidence and there were some limitations that didn't allow the authors to place a lot of stock on them. But the, the overall recommendation on the back of this paper was that athletes, um, uh, athletes who want to improve the, their sleep or improve their performance by improving their sleep. They could extend their sleep uh, up to two hours over to three to 49 nights or supplement with naps of 20 to 90 minutes. And we'll get to napping and the literature on that in a second. Yeah. So one thing that kind of stood out to me about this study is um, looking at the interventions that tended not to really improve sleep. Um, and specifically, well, not so much sleep as performance or recovery, but things like sleep hygiene, removing electronic devices at night, and that stuff seemed to have no effect on sleep or recovery or performance, which I've, uh, when I was a chronic insomniac, one of the first line treatments was uh, cognitive behavioral ther therapy tailored towards insomnia. And one of the big things during that is, hey, Make sure that your bedroom is cold, cool, uh, dark, you know, just maximizing sleep hygiene, essentially. And likewise with, hey, no screens for an hour at least before you go to sleep. So it's interesting to see that, oh, at least in these studies, it doesn't really seem to be an effect. And anecdotally, what I've noticed is um, the whole screens before bedtime thing, one, becomes less of an issue when you have certain tools in place like um, Flux, or even on Apple phone nowadays, you have the option to turn on a light light, which reduces, I think, blue light exposure. But two, I never really found it to impact my sleep all that much. And it was mostly just, hey, if being on your phone allows you to relax a little bit, then that's probably a bigger effect than the effect of uh, blue light exposure. And so like nowadays, I don't really pay too much attention to screen exposure before sleep provided I use those tools. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to see that some of the interventions that might be pushed most heavily in certain circumstances are also the ones that have the least evidence behind them. And sleep extension and naps were instead the interventions with probably the strongest evidence in this case. Yeah, one of the things that, that struck me about that a little bit as well is, um, I don't know, a, a lot of the things that... Uh, either lacked evidence that they worked or just had limited evidence overall. A lot of them fell into what I would consider kind of the like one weird trick strategy. Um, like the, 
you know, I think I think a lot of people I, I think that's I think that's alluring to a lot of people where you have two options. You could just try to get your ass in bed for an extra hour or two each night or you could try to to do a little bit of hacking, you know, like, ooh, if I get a little bit less blue light coming into my eyes before bed, is that going to help me sleep so much better that I don't actually need to modify anything in my life to sleep more? Uh, it would be very cool if that was the case, but eh, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to work out uh, all that well. You know, it might have a might have a positive effect, but we're not talking about a, a night and day difference. Um and yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I do think um I think I think that a lot of this stuff kind of falls into one of two categories. I think that there are uh interventions that are recommended for people who do like just legitimately struggle with sleep. Um you know, maybe they have some sort of like actual sleep disorder or just like some sort of like subclinical thing that negatively impacts their sleep and they're doing everything they can and they get in bed at a good time each night and they just struggle to sleep and, and I feel for them and that's rough. And for folks like that, things like sleep hygiene interventions, removing electronic devices, light therapy, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, when, when they're already, when they've moved the big rocks and sleep still isn't going well, then I think it does kind of make sense to say, Hey, what are, what are some more little dials I can try turning that, that will, that will help. Um, but I think that for a lot of people, uh, you know, they don't really struggle with sleep. They struggle with just getting in bed long enough and it, it is appealing to try to figure out like, oh, is there anything that I can do to kind of like optimize not sleeping enough instead of just getting my ass in bed? Um, <laughs> but I do think, I do think it's telling that, when folks talk about this stuff where, you know, if, if you see people talking about, oh, like, what what should you do to, like, get better outcomes subsequent to, like, better sleep? You do, or at least I, um, most frequently see, oh, hey, keep your room cool and dark and read a little before bed. Do some mindfulness meditation, kind of like sleep hygiene stuff. Maybe try to take a cold shower. Um, like, th things that if they worked would be very easy to implement because you don't really have to go out of your way to do it. Um, like, and it feels kind of like, Ooh, I found a little, a little like hack in the system to get better outputs without meaningfully changing the inputs all that much when, um, yeah, for, for most people, it does seem like the best thing to do is just get your ass in bed for longer, whether that's at night or napping through the day it's you know, it's it's hard it's hard it's hard to beat bigger interventions you know what i mean it's like uh it's like when it, like if if someone said hey i'm trying to get as jacked as possible but guess what i'm only willing to train 30 minutes a week it's like well okay we can we can try to optimize those 30 minutes you train but the thing that would help your outcomes a lot more is just training more you know uh and this this feels quite similar to me yeah, no, I, I agree. The The funny thing about all the interventions you mentioned, or is that I've tried them all uh, during my time as an insomniac, like the cold shower, the no screens, the um, just mindfulness, everything. So I think this, it may be different in people who are specifically suffering from chronic insomnia, what have you, where at that point, hey, just lying in bed for longer may not actually help you if you're already lying in bed for 10 to 12 hours a day. Um, but yeah, certainly in the context of athletic performance, it seems like you probably don't need to worry too much about your screen time and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say I would say maybe mechanistically, I don't know, not to not to get like too far down another rabbit hole, but like the screen time and like blue light blocking glasses and like light therapy and all of that. Um, I do. Uh, I don't want to say it's like complete pseudoscience because like there, there are some like positive, uh, positive findings in, in that area, but it feels, it feels a little like kind of like carbohydrate insulin model of obesity a little bit to me where you discover 
one mechanism that seems to make intuitive sense. And then a lot of the recommendations are extrapolations of some mechanistic uh, understanding rather than firm experimental results based on like clear and consistent human evidence where, you know, uh, the, the reason that that stuff is recommended is it has to do with like circadian rhythmicity where you entrain your circadian clocks based on blue light coming in your eyes during the day and then less coming in at night. And that's supposed to like help entrain your circadian rhythm and get like larger, more consistent melatonin release at night, like blah, 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 whatever. Like I'm sure, I'm sure most people listening to this have, have heard that. And I do think like, like my understanding is that that kind of mechanistic cascade is, is more or less correct. But then the crucial factor is, but how much does that actually improve sleep? And that is where the evidence is a little bit weaker and less consistent. Um, but I do think a lot of times, like if you can tell a good, compelling sounding mechanistic story, that will be more compelling to people than, you know, actual <laughs> solid evidence observing the outcomes people care about. Um, and I, I do think that's where a lot of, yeah, I I think that is where a lot of the sleep intervention stuff um kind of kind of heads towards, especially when it comes to like manipul manipulating the light coming into your eyes. Like like mechanistically it makes sense. I'm sure it has some effect, but I do think the the hype around it just far outstrips what we actually have that's like solidly supported by actual human evidence looking at sleep outcomes, not, you know, like hor acute hormonal outcomes of of unknown importance. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. I think it's always difficult to take a mechanistic rationale and then have a solid grounding to see that it's going to impact your outcome of interest. The same applies to lifting. Like, there's so many things or so many rationales you can form around different training interventions, different supplements, and what have you that could all mechanistically do something that you'd want. But then when you actually test them and look at their effect on the outcome of your interest, which is muscle growth, oftentimes it doesn't really work that way. And there's many more things they, that you need to consider f to accurately predict its effect, many of which we probably don't even know about yet. And for many interventions, you can form diametrically opposing um, mechanistic rationales that would lead you to opposite conclusions. And so oftentimes, the best way to know if something's working is to actually measure what you care about and see whether or not it works versus relying excessively on the rationale, the mechanistic rationale. And this applies to a lot of things within lifting, um, which Can is you why. Can you an example? Um, <laughs> there's a, a lot. Um, let's see. I was thinking I think of uh, range of motion uh, related. Oh, yes. I I can give an an exercise related one that is that is fun and isn't going to get angry angry comments uh, <laughs> and hopefully won't send us too far down a rabbit hole. Um, every every like Christmas, the um, is it is it BMJ? Yeah, yeah. The the British Medical Journal, I'm I'm pretty sure, does just kind of like a fun, you know, for for uh, just a a, a for a for goofs. At, uh, issue where they um, publish publish studies that are just like dumb. Uh, whether that's the the infamous does garlic actually repel vampires study, where uh, they said, "Look, we couldn't get our hands on any vampires, but leeches are close enough. They also suck your blood. So let's just do a little paper to see if garlic uh, keeps leeches from from attaching to you." Uh, to the example I'm going to give, which is. Uh, there was a narrative review about the impact of cigarette smoking on athletic performance and um, the classic there, there an underutilized uh, tool in uh, uh, sport performance or something. Yeah. 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 And what, what the authors do is like, they look at like all of these little, these little things that like are, are correlated with, with endurance performance and, uh, smoking also kind of like 
affects similar pathways. Um, and they're like, yeah, uh, based on based on these mechanistic reasons, we're smoking will ab- absolutely help you run faster. And like, it doesn't. It the, the whole point of the paper is to illustrate how getting way out over your skis, talking about like mechanisms while just completely ignoring either more important, more relevant mechanisms or actual like outcome data can lead you so far astray that you could make a case that smoking improves athletic performance, like improves running performance. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that's a, a decent object lesson in, in, in this sort of phenomenon. Yeah. It's the Canadian medical, uh, medical association journal. Cause you said BMJ and I was like, wait, was there another smoking, uh, Smoking paper because uh, it's a classic paper I give to people. Oh, it uh, it must have been they they must have gotten in on it with the with the smoking paper then because I I'm I'm quite confident it's, that it's BMJ that that does like the annual issue. Yeah, I can see here holiday reading because I've never opened the PDF and it just says holiday reading and satire and the paper is called cigarette smoking an underused tool in high performance endurance training and it's uh it's a re- really cool paper to show people and be like look you can spin whatever you want and make the case for many things if you really, really want to, just relying on mechanisms. Yes, absolutely. Moving on to, so yeah, what we've done here is essentially since we've already touched on sleep extension and because napping was one of the things that the authors of the 2023 systematic review identified as another uh, potential uh, sleep intervention that can actually have uh, an impact on uh, athletic performance. We have just prepared a, a rough overview of the napping literature. And I think you, Greg, are one of the more qualified ones here. I'll touch on the systematic review and meta-analysis that we've we've selected to cover, but I think you've covered napping quite a bit in the past as well. I don't think so. Honestly, you don't, you um, haven't, is that a Mandela effect on my end? We, I know we've talked about it on the podcast. I'm quite confident. That's a segment that Trex did. Um, Mm. I'll, I'll, I'll tip my hand here. Uh, I I shouldn't admit this, but I will. Um, there are, (laughs) when, when it comes to, uh, okay. So some, some interventions, are um they just like intuitively like it it makes sense that they would improve you know particular outcomes and you know things that are positively influenced by sleep uh that we know to be positively influenced by sleep are they going to be positively influenced by napping well napping is sleeping so i i i bet it does and then you to just take a peek at a systematic review and it says, hey, napping helps all of these things that you would expect it to help. And I'm like, okay, that's cool, whatever. Don't need to look into it much further. Um, especially if it's an intervention that I myself am never going to personally use. Uh, so like sleep extension is kind of similar. It's like, yeah, it's sleeping more, sleeping more seems to be good, whatever. And I'll tell you what, I like getting an extra hour or two in bed at night. Uh, so I'm going to read those studies when it comes to napping, the findings seem intuitive. There's nothing that seems like too interesting or surprising there. And your boy doesn't nap. I've never been a napper. I can't do it. I can't fall asleep in the middle of the day. So I don't care that much about (laughs) getting like super deep into this body of literature. Uh, so yeah, like I'm, I'm kind of familiar with it, but not like super familiar with it. Cool. On that note, we are going to be looking closer, cl- more closely at some of the evidence. And <laughs> uh, for some reason, I don't know. I thought, Greg, uh, you were like a, a napping uh, sort of expert for some reason. Like in my head, I remember, I don't know, hearing you speak right on mass about it, but it's it's probably me not napping enough and forgetting stuff. But regardless, we we're going to look at a systematic review and meta analysis of randomized control trials ch- attempting to answer the question: Is daytime napping an effective strategy to improve sport-related cognitive and physical performance and reduce fatigue? 
That's a lot of questions. So the authors here uh, looked at randomized tri uh, control trials on daytime napping and its impact on sport performance and fatigue. Um, and they included studies that uh, included adults and physically active or, you know, athlete participants. They didn't include anybody under 18, non-athletes or physically inactive uh, participants, or studies uh, that happened uh, during Ramadan, which I think finishes soon or finished i think so happy uh, end of ramadan if it did finish so from three over three thousand studies they identified 22 that met their inclusion criteria and they were interestingly most of those studies were conducted in uh, tunisia focusing on male participants again aged 18 to 35 uh, that were athletes or physically active adults they the, the studies included both cognitive and physical performance uh, measurements, uh, including the perception of fatigue, and they found that napping, drum roll, doo -doo 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 -doo, improved cognitive and physical performance and reduced fatigue after a normal night's sleep. Now, the benefits of napping were more pronounced for naps between thirty and sixty minutes, and uh, when the time from nap to awakening, uh, from nap awakening to the test. So to the, the performance outcome test that they were interested in was uh, over 60 minutes. So not you know, napping and then straight up jumping into whatever test uh, they were tested in. Daytime, na daytime napping after partial sleep deprivation also showed positive effects, although the evidence on that was not as solid. So there were fewer studies that investigated that and the data was less robust. Um, so overall, the findings are more conclusive for naps following a normal sleep night, which essentially, again, proves the humble napping expert Greg Knuckles as right, whereas, hey, more sleep, probably good for you, because um, that's exactly what they found, and they said su suggesting that napping can enhance performance even if you've slept enough. However, as with most studies, limitations must be taken in consideration. So there was a, a considerable heterogeneity among su studies and small sample sizes, as well as reporting bias, somewhat limits the amount of confidence that we can have on them. Um, the results, again, are based on young male participants. So that's something that we also need to take into consideration. And that's something the research needs to do better in terms of including more female participants. And yeah, that's pretty much the overview of that. I have made uh, a side note here on a systematic review meta-analysis and meta-regression on the impact of daytime napping following normal nighttime sleep and physical performance, but I'll first ask if you have any comments, if the panel, the napping panel here at Stronger by Science Podcast has any comments on this particular publication. I'll let the expert go first. Uh, yeah, I, I got I got nothing. Couldn't have said it better myself. Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> but I did, <laughs> I did, I did just want to make one note of something you said. Uh, Ramadan is not yet over as we're recording this, but it will be over by the time the episode comes out. So a happy belated Eid to all of our uh, all of our Muslim listeners. Shout out. Um, what I was going to say regarding the study is. The one thing that struck me as notable, but also intuitive, is that the effect of napping on performance was more pronounced, or benefit rather, when um, when there was some delay between ending the nap and starting the performance test. Personally, the odd few times I've napped in my life, I can probably count on one hand, but when I do, I always wake up feeling absolutely disorientated like i'm jet lagged by 12 hours or something and so if i were to try and squat a max right then and there yeah it probably wouldn't go so well it might even go <laughs> quite a bit worse than if i hadn't napped altogether but if you give me an hour eh, maybe it'll go a little better so i think it is worth noting that if you're going to train straight thereafter maybe don't nap or maybe take a shorter nap to allow for some time between the two but um otherwise hey looks like a nap or another ergogenic tool you know I, I i do question how much they'd help if you're sleeping a lot but that is ultimately what this next study is um going to answer i guess from uh from my personal so my personal anecdote on napping is that there is there are these like when 
I've been sleep deprived, not for a long time, but when I've had those couple of nights of horrible sleep and I've tried to sneak in that like 10 to 20 minute nap, there are times where those 10 minutes where you're kind of asleep and you are, but you're not. And then you get up, but you like, you force yourself to get out of bed before you fall into deep sleep. Those sometimes are game changers for some reason, even though I'm, I know that I'm not, you know, sleeping much and I sometimes I'm not really fully asleep. Those 10 to 20 minutes in bed, I don't know if it's the act and maybe there's like a bit of a placebo. But as you said, bro, like there's been those times where the, the 30 minute the nap turned into a two and a half hour blast. And I, yeah, I, I, I sometimes I would wake up and think I was still in Germany uh, where I lived like 12 years ago. I'd be like, where am I? Oh, yeah, I'm in Southampton. And then slowly retrace my life and be like, okay, yeah, it's Tuesday. And I wanted to go to the gym. Cool. But yeah. Those weren't very good. Those weren't great for at least feeling good before the gym. Yeah, it's tricky. It feels like a bad hangover. That that seems intuitive to me. Like I said, no no experience with this. Uh, the handful of times that I've that I've tried to nap, either I just don't fall asleep, and you know I do think I do think like regardless of whether you technically enter phase one sleep or not. Um, I do I do think when you're just kind of like tired and stressed and fatigued, just like taking 10 minutes to close your eyes, lay down, take a few deep breaths. I do think it's nice. Like I it 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 I think can kind of help recharge your battery a little bit, uh, whether or not you you actually nap. Um but the handful of times that I've actually been sleep deprived enough to attempt to nap and successfully fall asleep. I don't have the like two and a half hour nap type experience. I have the type of experience where I lay down at 3 p.m. and say, yeah, I'm going to try to take a 30 minute nap. And I wake up at like 9 a.m. the next morning. Um, that's like, <laughs> that is, is good. That's how tired I need to be in order to be able to nap. And I think when you're that sleepy, uh, you know, trying to take a nap when you're that sleep deprived is just kind of like pissing into the ocean. Like it's, it's the, not going to do anything. The napping expert finally shows us cards. Turns out there is one weird trick to napping for 18 hours straight. <laughs> he, had us, he had us in the first half, but then coming through with the tricks now. Yeah, it's... Oh, you, you like napping? I think calling oh. that a nap is a, is a bit debatable, but whatever. <laughs> You're the expert here. And the new definition has been proposed. It's like advanced napping. Yeah, I nap 12 hours at night. <laughs> yeah, much like much like resistance training, vo volume for napping is really important. You know, like the the previous discussion was whether uh, it was better to nap twenty plus minutes per week versus uh, ten to twenty. But you know, if if you ramp that up <laughs> to three thousand minutes per week, and you still call it napping, who knows? Who knows? Nah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, the the next. <laughs> Uh, the next uh, systematic review that we're very quickly going to gloss over, gloss over, gloss, gloss over. I can have a weird accent. That's okay. Culture. I'm Greek. Um, by actually one of the authors from one of the papers that we looked at, and it seems that uh, there is quite a few things napping related uh, or sleep extension related from their lab. So by Bukris um, et al. from the University of, I'm committed to this now. It's it's a bit weird because there's many affiliations here. So, an Australian university in Melbourne, La Trobe University. There we go. Um, they looked at the impact of daytime napping following normal nighttime sleep on physical performance. And they essentially, again, looked at physically active individuals and athletes Um they included studies examining the effect of daytime naps following a normal sleep cycle on physical performance measures um, in, again, physically active people and athletes. I repeated myself there. My apologies. But napping essentially led to improved performance in highest and total distance in the five-meter shuffle run test and um, re reduced fatigue. However, they did not observe a significant effect on muscle force and the impact of napping on other performance measures like the, like sprint performance, 30-second wing gate test, uh, jump performance, repeated sprints, upper body power and endurance was inconclusive given the limited literature directly exploring those areas. That was just more uh, just as a side note because both both of those uh, papers were published at similar 
times. Uh, not exactly the same times, but close by. So there wasn't a whole lot of uh, actual literature to review, but I thought it would be good to touch on. Yeah, I mean, once again, one thing is that the one or two outcomes that did seem to be positively impacted, or at least more convincingly so in this study, and, you know, not a lot of studies to go off of here, are the ones that might have a bit more of a skill component. So, for example, the Wingate test once again failed to be noted as being positively impacted by much. Um, but regardless, I don't think there's enough studies here to really dig into, but it's... Um, it seems as though napping might still be beneficial, at least acutely, even when you have had pretty good decent sleep the previous night. So that's kind of my takeaway from this one. Yep. And that more or less uh, sums up the the literature on napping and I, in general sleep extension for this part of the episode. So we've... We've talked about uh, the the impact of sleep on athletic performance, but now let's circle back to some of the stuff we talked about in episode one, um, which mostly uh, discussed the deleterious effects of not getting enough sleep or not getting enough high quality sleep. Um, as we discussed in that episode, I think there is a bit of fear mongering around that topic and a lot of the drawbacks are are maybe a little bit overblown. They certainly exist, but they're not as as catastrophic as a lot of people think, but they are still there. So that leads to the question of if you're not sleeping the recommended seven to eight hours per night, or if you struggle to get good quality sleep, is there anything you can do to mitigate some of the damage that might be caused um, by not sleeping as much as you would like to. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit here. And in this case, I would say most interventions that aim to mitigate the downsides of not sleeping enough do tend to not work particularly well. But this is an instance where there is kind of one weird trick that does yeah. help paper over a lot of the damage that might be done by not sleeping enough. And uh, it's not it's not like a biohackery thing. It's not the type of thing where you can take a pill or a supplement or do something that takes two minutes and it's going to make all the difference in the world. It is uh, a bit more intensive and a bit more of a time-consuming intervention, but one that does seem to work quite well. And... Uh, what what might that be? Mm hmm. It is. So it is what it is. One weird trick and the very SBS nice. melatonin supplement. <laughs> 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 By now, uh, melatonin not included. <laughs> um, but it is physical activity, which we are essentially indirectly selling by selling your educational content on physical activity. So. Hey ho, SBS has done it again. But joking aside, um, physical activity does seem to be one of those, well, one weird trick that you can actually do to mitigate um, some of the da damage done by sleeping less. And there was um, a study called Can Physical Activity Eliminate the Mortality Risk Associated with Poor Sleep? A 15-year follow-up of 341 uh, 248,000 uh, MJ cohort participants. So essentially, the authors here used, utilized data from the MJ cohort, including adults in uh, Taiwan in, and, and in China, focusing on those who participated between 1998 and 2008. So they assessed sleep patterns through self-reported sleep duration um, and disturbances, while physical activity was gauged uh, based on leisure time activities, uh, which were then converted to metabolic equivalent hours per week. Now, they had mortality um, data available, and they were linked to the cause of death register, which then allowed them to also make adjustments for various lifestyle and health factors. And among, I'm not going to quote the exact number of participants again, I'm going to say 
300,000 plus participants. Long sleep duration uh, was associated with increased all-cause cardiovascular and cancer mortality risk, which we've alluded to. Difficulty falling asleep and the use of sleeping medication also indicated higher mortality risks. But more importantly, high physical uh, activity levels, which were defined as over 30 mets, um, met hours per week, it significantly reduced or eliminated the increased mortality risk associated with poor sleep patterns. More specifically, all cause and cardiovascular disease mortality. Uh, so, for those, high physical activity levels mitigated the increased risks from long sleep duration or difficulty falling asleep, as well as sleeping medication use. And the most physically inactive group um, combined with Long sleep duration over eight hours had surprise, somewhat surprisingly, the highest um, all cause and cardiovascular disease mortality risk. Lower levels of physical activity were also related with um, an increase in all cause and cardiovascular mortality, but not um, risk, but not cancer mortality. And high levels of physical activity could, so the authors noted that they could potentially offset um, some of the adverse effects of long sleep duration and sleep uh, disturbances on mortality. Poor sleep patterns, including long sleep durations and disturbances um, in general, were associated with higher mortality risks, but being physically active did help. I repeated myself there at the end, but hey-ho, it's a positive message, and hearing it twice is not going to do much harm. It do be bearing repeating. Um, <laughs> the few things that struck me from this is, one, the most physically inactive group that also had a long sleep duration having the highest all-cause mortality risk makes a lot of sense when you consider it in the context of, hey, people who are pretty ill, they're likely to be in bed for longer slash sleeping for longer, and they're also likely to be pretty inactive and or a combination thereof, kind of creating an environment where those people are more likely to have poor health than other ones. The other thing is, I think this study is a similar case as many of the VO2 max studies, I suspect, um, where... It essentially says, hey, if you're more physically active or you have a higher VO2 max than the other case, you see better health. Um, but in this case, the high physical activity levels were considered above 30 met hours per week. Now, to give you some context, um, a metabolic equivalent is essentially a an oxygen or an energy expenditure equivalent, if I recall correctly. Uh, so it's, oxygen consumption. It's um, supposed to be... Multiples of how much energy you expend at rest. Yep. Um, and so one met is, is what you spend at rest, right? Yeah. And when it's quantified in terms of VO2, I think it's 3.5 mLs per yep. kg per minute. Yep. That is correct, yeah. That's what I remember as well. Um, but regardless, in this case, the highest physical activity bracket was considered above 30 met hours per week. And just to give some context of what that would mean in terms of physical activity, walking at a pace of like three miles an hour at a very slight incline of one to five percent has a metabolic equivalent of three mets. And so if you did that for 10 hours a week, 10 hours of slight incline walking at a relatively moderate pace, you're already meeting 30 met hours per week. And so just 10 hours of walking per week would get you into the highest physical activity bracket in this study, which was generally most associated with reduced risk of um, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, and so forth. Um, and so you don't need to be thinking, all right, I have poor sleep. Let me go ahead and exercise for 10 hours a day to make up for this. We're talking about not a whole lot of activity being required to offset much of the potential detrimental effect of poor sleep on your um, potential health. So I think that's one important thing to take away is that much like with lifting, where that dose response relationship with health may not extend to super high levels, it's kind of the same thing here where you don't need to do a ton to see most, if not all of the benefit in terms of health. I just wanted to to uh, just quickly note, because I only mentioned long sleep duration, is that the authors of the of the paper uh, only found uh, an increase in mortality risk with long duration sleepers, whereas there was no significant increase in mortality risk amongst um, short duration sleepers. Because uh, if somebody just if somebody heard the summary, they they could think, okay, 
that's great for people that may be sleeping longer than needed or having poor sleep because they also identified uh, sleep disturbance. But what about me and my six hours, seven hours of sleep or whatever? Back to you, Greg. Well, I, I mean, the the findings here really weren't out of out of step with what we talked about in episode one. Like you do in the in the um, epidemiological research and especially like meta analyses of epidemiological studies when you're pooling together millions and millions of participants. You do you do tend to see a slight increase in mortality risk with sleeping less than six hours per day. Um, and when you have larger samples and more statistical power, those small differences are statistically significant. And when you don't, sometimes they aren't. In this case, um, the all-cause mortality rates of sleeping six to eight hours per night were just defined to be 1.0, and everything else was compared to that. Um, and sleeping less than six hours per night, it was 1.023, which wasn't statistically significant, but it is like nominally slightly increased risk. And just making the point that it wasn't statistically significant here, but small increases in risk were statistically significant in some of the other papers we discussed previously. Ultimately, they're not in conflict. You know, just that's uh, some when you're dealing with small effects, they're going to be somewhat noisy and you need huge samples and a lot of power to detect it. But yeah, the, it, y there was like a at least like a nominal increased risk of, of short sleep here. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, across the board, getting more physical activity help, see, seemed to be associated with better mortality outcomes. And that was that was independent of uh, whether people weren't sleeping much or if they were sleeping a lot um, in particular. Uh, just looking at at all calls mortality with people who were basically sedentary, like getting fewer than seven and a half met hours of exercise per week versus the people who were the most active. Um, and I'm just purely eyeballing this. And this is a uh, it's an open access paper. You can pull this up and look at it for yourself um, and get into the like precise numbers if that's something that interests you. But just just looking at it, um, it looks like there's maybe a five, 10 percent difference in all calls mortality rates uh, for the people who are like basically sedentary, fewer than seven and a half med hours per week. Um, seems like fewer than six hours per day was maybe five, 10 percent worse than six to eight. And um, more than eight was maybe. 25, 30% worse than six to eight hours per day. And then comparing those sedentary folks to the most active folks, more than 30 met hours per week, the all calls mortality rates just across the board for all sleep categories were lower with 30 met hours than seven and a half. And um, the relative differences to six to eight hours per week were also smaller as well. So like, Nominally and non-significantly, uh, all-cause mortality rates in people sleeping less than six hours per day and exercising a lot were actually slightly lower than people sleeping six to eight hours per day and exercising a lot. I don't think that's causal. Don't read into that too much. But you you did see that like flipping of an effect of it being like slightly non-significantly worse to slightly non-significantly better. But if there it, it looks like if there is a negative effect that significantly mitigates as exercise levels increase um and with uh more than 8 hours per day there there was still like a nominally but now non-significantly greater all calls mortality rate with sleeping more than 8 hours per day versus 6 to 8 but instead of it being like a 25-30% difference it looks like now we're maybe talking about like a 10% difference. So it like very substantially um, uh, mitigates mitigates that effect. Um, and, and you see pretty similar things with uh, cancer and, and cardiovascular uh, disease outcomes as well. Although for cardiovascular disease, it there just really didn't seem to be anything there at all for sleeping less than six hours per day. Um, but yeah, like if it, it looks like, especially with the long sleep duration, if there was any increase in risk, um, it 
appear to be like substantially mitigated, if not going away altogether, um, just by exercising more. So it does seem that if you're somebody who may be at times or in general struggling with sleep without that meaning that you're sleeping, you know, two hours a night and barely falling asleep other nights, that if you're exercising, either that being engaging in resistance training or just being physically active, that you may be actually okay to, uh, a, you know, to a certain level, which is great news. More positive vibes over here. But it's true. Like this, I, I feel that myself included, like reading reading into the literature and, and, and seeing this, because that was, that was an area of the literature I wasn't fully aware. I knew that, you know, you don't need nine hours of sleep per night to be healthy. But the reading that, okay, by f being physically active and exercising, you can actually tick even more boxes and, and ensure that those f few nights of bad sleep are not actually causing much uh, harm. That was, um, that was good to read, and it will help me sleep better at night. Pun intended. What about protein synthesis, you ask, uh, imaginary listener? Yeah, yeah, so... Um one of the things that we discussed in the first episode is that, um, like, I, I think a lot of people strongly assume, and for not horrible reasons, that not sleeping enough will negatively impact their strength gains and muscle growth. Um, and and like we talked about in the last episode, there's no, like, firm, um, like, direct human evidence to confirm that in part because it would be a logistical nightmare to try to run an actual like randomized control trial looking at like a longitudinal sleep restriction plus resistance training intervention like that's no one's no one's going to want to be in the sleep restriction group and it's already enough of a headache just to run a training study so eh whatever that direct research doesn't exist um but like we talked about in the last episode the research looking at body comp outcomes in diet only studies when people are sleeping a lot versus sleeping a little um, do suggest that when people aren't sleeping enough, um, they do tend to lose more lean mass and less fat mass when exposed to an energy deficit and they lose weight. Um, and that I think pretty understandably leads people to suspect that if they don't sleep enough, that's going to negatively impact their muscle growth, body comp outcomes, et cetera. And as a kind of like mechanistic underpinning of that, one of the things that you see is that with sleep restriction, um, basal like baseline levels of muscle protein synthesis decrease. Um, so just in the absence of exercise, you know, you're, you're synthesizing a particular amount of new muscle protein all the time. Like there's, there's a rate at which that occurs. Um, and we've talked about on the podcast before how you can't just draw like just a straight one-to-one -one line between muscle protein, acute muscle protein synthesis and longitudinal hypertrophy outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. But it is at least still a directional indicator. Overall, most of the time, higher muscle protein synthesis should be good for muscle growth. Lower should generally be bad. And so when you when you see decreased rates of muscle protein synthesis with sleep restriction, uh, in the absence of longitudinal evidence, that does at least give like indirect support for the idea that, yeah, like it, it might negatively uh, impact your muscle growth. But uh, then the question becomes, what if you also did a little exercise? Uh, do you see muscle protein synthesis still being uh, suppressed? And so there is a 2020 paper uh, that will be linked in the show notes by Saner and colleagues. Uh, title was The Effect of Sleep Restriction with or without High Intensity Interval Exercise on Myofibrillar Protein Synthesis in Healthy Young Men. Um, and in effect, I mean fairly fairly straightforward uh when people w when you took muscle protein synthesis measures at rest uh not sleeping much guess what decreased muscle protein synthesis uh but then when you add an exercise stimulus which in this case um wasn't even uh like a resistance training stimulus it was uh some high intensity interval training 
um, that completely like rescued and, and ameliorated the uh, negative impact of, of poor sleep on muscle protein synthesis. So um, I don't know. We, we don't want to get like too far out over our skis and draw like too firm of conclusions from a study like this and say, no, it is absolutely the case that if you're not sleeping at all, but you're still lifting, you'll get exactly the same muscle growth and exactly the same body comp outcomes as you would if you were sleeping a lot. Um, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't draw that type of inference here. Acute study might not perfectly generalize to longitudinal outcomes, but it does at least um, it should assuage some of the concerns. I think at least a little bit about um, short sleep duration on body comp outcomes. Um, because I do think it's fairly intuitive that you'll lose more lean mass when you're in an energy deficit, if you're not sleeping enough, and that is reducing your rates of muscle protein synthesis. But if exercise can get your rates of muscle protein synthesis back to where more or less where they would be if you were sleeping enough, that at least suggests to me that if it doesn't completely wipe out the difference in body comp outcomes, it should, I would suspect, significantly uh, uh, mitigate those effects such that you would get longitudinal outcomes that should be more similar to sleeping enough, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. I Please just wanted to, to touch on the this particular study because the, the sleep restriction group actually had four hours in bed if i recall recall correctly whereas the the non-sleep restriction group the normal sleep group had eight hours and despite that just um so they their the exact training protocol was uh they did 10 intervals of cycling at 90 percent of the participants peak power um for and then they they had like a, an interval of 60 seconds with 75 seconds of active recovery at 60 watts between intervals and just that um, was enough, as you said, to sort of counteract the effects of pretty, pretty, pretty bad sleep. I mean, four hours in bed, that for, for some five, people could... Five nights, for a five, five night nights intervention. As well, yeah. yeah. So for some people, that could have been two hours of sleep at night, obviously. Like, okay, now I'm yeah. just pulling stuff. Now I'm just making stuff up. But yeah, it's it was pretty bad. And and measuring like longitude. So oh, nah, I, I didn't know if I wanted to... Get in, get into the weeds of assessing muscle protein synthesis, but whatever, I, it's relevant here. We've there are multiple it. ways you can. There are multiple ways you can do it. Um, a lot of times, you'll see the tracer amino acid method, where you look at rates of phenylalanine incorporation into muscle tissue over maybe up to four hours post exercise, and that's it. So it's it is like a really acute short term snapshot. The method they used in this study was uh, using deuterium, deuterium oxide, um, which is just like a tracer method that allows you to assess muscle protein synthesis over a longer time period. So instead of like a four-hour snapshot after a training intervention, um, you can look at uh, elapsed rates of muscle protein synthesis over the entire five days. Um and so, yeah, like I, I do think that these are probably due to the way that muscle protein synthesis was assessed, even though this was a very short term study, I think we can have like a little bit more confidence about its generalizability to longitudinal outcomes because it was like an assessment over five days versus like four hours. Um, five days, still short term. Five days is not 16 weeks, as I think we're all aware but it's a heck of a lot closer, proportionally speaking, than just taking like a two, three, four hour snapshot. So, um, yeah, the, the, just based on the way that they assessed protein synthesis in this study, I do think it gives us like a little bit more confidence about generalizability than we would if they used a, a different method. Yeah, no, um, I, I tend to agree with all those takeaways. The one thing is... I do tend to think that the results might have been even more favorable had they used something in the resistance training realm. So obviously, oh, interval yeah, yeah. training can absolutely induce increases in muscle mass and increases in myofibrillar protein synthesis and all that. But I suspect the difference between the sleep deprivation group 
restriction in this case, and the normal sleep group would have been even smaller had they used a resistance training protocol instead. Um, just in general, from what I've seen, resistance training interventions tend to reduce variance. So essentially just um, make hypertrophy outcomes a little bit more similar, if anything. Um, so yeah, I just tend to think that differences might have been even more attenuated had it been a resistance training study. But one important application of this study, I think, is while you don't typically want to use mechanistic rationales or mechanistic findings as the be-all, end-all when it comes to informing your training, nutrition, sleep, lifestyle practices at all, when you're talking about an area where the longitudinal research actually measuring the outcome of interest is not available, that may just be the best research to rely upon that you have at your disposal. And so in this case, I do actually think the study is worth worthy of consideration to a relatively large extent as a big piece of the puzzle alongside the systematic reviews we have on sleep duration and how that can impact potentially more skilled or more performance outcomes versus just pure hypertrophy. Because then when you put those things together, you can say, okay, well, seems like not sleeping enough might be a bad deal when it comes to more skilled um, sports skills, like you could argue some lifting might be. And it seems like not sleeping enough can negatively impact protein metabolism on a hypertrophy level. Put those together and not sleeping enough is probably not the best idea, but it seems like still lifting is definitely going to uh, salvage that situation to a very, very large extent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What 100%. A, an, another example of like a negative outcome of sleep restriction that exercise tends to help with. Um, and that is if you don't sleep enough, I'm sure you find you're a little more scatterbrained. Uh, your your cognitive function, your executive function, your your willpower maybe is it can take a little bit of a hit the next day. Um, you know, your your brain seems to work better when you sleep enough. I think everyone who's had a bad night of sleep intuitively understands that. Um, one of the things that we generally see is that exercise improves all of those things. Improves cognitive function, improves executive function, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so then the question is, well, can you put those two things together? Uh, if you have compromised executive and cognitive function due to not sleeping enough, can you then exercise and see the same types of improvements such that your brain works slightly closer to how it would if you would have slept enough? And um, there's not a ton of research on this. Like, I didn't spend like hours and hours searching, but I looked I looked around a little bit and I was only able to find one paper on it. It'll be linked in the show notes. Um, I don't think it's worth going into all of the details of it, but in effect, the extremely scant evidence that does exist um, does suggest that if you exercise following sleep restriction, it does help uh, bring your, your executive function back closer to what it would normally be if you slept enough. Um, so yeah, not only will exercise help you Make sure you're you're gonna you're gonna live a long time if you're uh, struggling with sleep. Not not only is it going to make sure you're still synthesizing muscle protein, uh, you know, closer to normal if you have a few nights of bad sleep. Uh, it also seems to improve executive function. Um, one of one of the other, um, uh, just like one of the <laughs> things that you come across. There, there aren't a lot of like combined interventions, I guess, um, uh, a lot of times like and that that I think makes intuitive sense. You know, like there there are like there's a lot of research that's like, hey, does exercise improve this outcome? Cool. OK, we have that body of research. And then there are studies that are like, hey, does not sleeping enough have negative impacts on this particular outcome? And Oftentimes it does, and cool, now we have that body of research. Very rarely do you see, like, crossover stuff where it's like, ooh, well, we know sleep does this, we know exercise does this. If we, if we don't sleep enough, but we exercise, does that, does that bring, us, bring us closer to normal? Um, there's not as much research there as I would like there to be. Um, I suspect there is... 
there are a lot more outcomes that not sleeping enough negatively affects where if you also exercise it it significantly ameliorates the negative effects of poor sleep um but yeah there's there's just not that many kind of like crossover studies there testing those those two separate things but i will note every and i'm not exaggerating here in every instance where i have looked for research along those lines and the research exists and i've been able to find it it is the exact same trend every time like take a negative impact of not sleeping enough uh and if that is also a thing where independently exercise seems to have a positive effect if you add exercise on top of not sleeping enough it significantly ameliorates the negative impact of not sleeping enough like that is you know i don't want to say with complete confidence that that is a 100% universal thing across the board but it thus far has been a 100% universal thing in all uh in all categories where i've been able to find research um just just another example here uh not sleeping enough negatively impacts uh glucose tolerance glucose disposal insulin sensitivity all of that stuff uh public health people um discuss uh poor quality sleep maybe being an independent risk factor contributing to the epidemic of type 2 diabetes that we're seeing uh guess what exercise tends to positively impact all of those things and also guess what i know of exactly one study <laughs> looking at uh the impact of exercise following uh short sleep on glucose disposal and, and uh like glucose tolerance testing and guess what it it brings shit back to normal <laughs> so you know the just just another example of um and, and and that'll be linked in the show notes as well. Title, if you want to look that up, is Exercise Mitigates Sleep Loss Induced Changes in Glucose Tolerance, Mitochondrial Function, Sarcoplasmic Protein Synthesis, and Diurnal Rhythms. Uh, so they're, they're just in the title. You have four things that sleep negatively impacts that if you add a little bit of exercise into the mix, uh, brings stuff uh, back closer to normal. So I think our general takeaway from this whole section is that if there exists one weird trick to mitigate the harms that poor sleep uh, can cause it's exercise like it mm -hmm. and and you don't it's you don't need to like exercise like a professional athlete to do it um the exercise interventions used in these studies haven't been anything completely ludicrous or intense like the the meta-analysis looking at, at all calls in cardiovascular and cancer mortality, 30 met hours per week, that is not an enormous amount of exercise. Um, the other studies I've talked about that have that have looked at um, like shorter-term exercise interventions and in, in some of these outcomes, we're not talking about people doing like hours and hours of exercise. Like there, there are sessions where you can get in, hit something pretty hard for 15, 20, 30 minutes, get out, you're good to go. Um, it, it really is hard to overstate how just doing a little bit of exercise can, can paper over so many negative things, um, including negative things, uh, brought about by not sleeping enough. So if you want one weird trick to mitigate most of the harms of, of poor sleep, it's exercise, just do some exercise and that helps so much. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And to go even further than that, and really encourage your listeners to potentially take the exercise pill, um, to my knowledge, and we're not going to delve into this too deeply, and based also on my anecdote, exercising tends to help with sleep. And so if you're not sleeping well, and you're concerned that might impact your health, if nothing else, exercising and taking the exercise pill is going to help you with sleep down the line and kind of remedy the initial issue that caused potentially not exercising. Because one thing I think people with relatively poor sleep can sometimes do, and I fell into this trap, is to say, ah, I'm not feeling 100%. Let me just wait and not exercise and I'll, I'll exercise when I feel better. And to an extent, I think that is probably a negative habit to fall into. 
I think if you're dealing with a few poor nights of sleep or if you're dealing with consistent slight sleep issues, it is probably still worth taking the excess pill because it will both enhance your sleep and because in many aspects it seems to remedy some of the issues caused by poor sleep in the first place. So I would say if you're having poor sleep, do still try and get some activity in. Does it need to be your hardest session ever? No. Would it still benefit your overall um, hypertrophy and potentially sleep as well? In all likelihood, it would. So I would recommend to take the exercise pill regardless. For sure. And 100%. If, you're, if you're having trouble sleeping and you are unable to, to stay in bed for whatever, seven to eight hours because of your work, of your studies, exercising and doing your best to maintain um, sleep regularity, going to bed and waking up within an hour of, of the same time every day, you're taking a lot of boxes, um, a lot of important boxes as far as health goes. So you're not doomed. And just because you may not be getting this... Um, sort of amazing sleep that people talk about and you hear everyone recommending, you know, eight to nine hours in bed and sleep quality and tracking sleep and deep sleep and so on and so forth. If you're taking those boxes, it's likely that you're not missing out on a ton of uh, health benefits from sleep directly. Okay, do we do we have anything else on this or can we switch gears and uh, cover some some listener questions? We sure can. All right. I think we're uh, good. So yeah, well, let's uh, let's lead off uh, a question by Ali Shah. Uh, does sleep have to be consecutive? Uh, for example, Muslims waking up for morning prayer. Could you sleep seven hours, wake up for twenty minutes, then go back to bed for another hour? Um, like, w- would that be similar to just sleeping all eight hours per once, or is is there something negative about that? I mean. Oh, please, Milo. No, I was actually going to say, um, my general stance on this is that there probably is a benefit to waking up after a full sleep cycle has elapsed, and sleep cycles generally last about 90 minutes. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, if you have the option between sleeping, say, four sleep cycles and then waking up, and that's it, six hours a night, for example, or sleeping for six hours and then waking up for a little bit and going back to sleep for another hour and a half or three hours. Typically, I would opt for a ladder. Like, I don't think just because your sleep was fractured that any additional sleep is not beneficial. It just kind of reduces overall sleep quality a little bit. That is sort of my general takeaway from the stuff I've read, but it's not an area of research I'm super familiar with, so I'm definitely open to what um, you both have to say. So No, my, um, my take is exactly the same as yours. God damn it. Yeah, 100% I, then. I agree. Um, and for this particular example where seven hours of sleeping has been has been used and, you know, sleeping for seven, seven hours, waking up for 20 minutes and then sleeping for another hour, uh, based on everything that we've reviewed, I, I'd say that it's fine. Obviously, if we're to slightly look at sleep regularity, if you were to, you know, randomly wake up at different times and sleep at different times and, and that impacted it, yeah, maybe that's that's not the best idea as far as optimizing uh, sleep-related health benefits. However, for the month of Ramadan, for example, if you're sleeping seven hours, waking up for 20 minutes to, to do your morning prayer and going back, and especially if you're going back to bed for another hour, or even if you're sleeping five to six hours and then going to bed for another hour, I very much doubt that that one month is going to have any any actual meaningful effect on your overall health, especially if you're still sleeping uh, at night, as the the listener noted. All right, uh, next question from Big Jonathan Stud. Would you adjust a calorie surplus when bulking with insomnia? Parentheses, five or less hours of sleep per night. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess it ultimately comes down to your goals and your current lifestyle and all that. Um, I think that if you're going purely for quote-unquote lean gains and you're really concerned with minimizing fat gain alongside your hypertrophy, then I would probably reduce the calorie surplus slightly. Um, But that is also true, more broadly speaking, even in the absence of insomnia, is if you're more concerned with lean gains and not putting on fat, then maybe keep a pretty small calorie surplus of maybe like 
one to three hundred calories or so. Um, but then on the flip side, if you're someone who's happy with dreamer bulking, as I'm sure many of us have been at one point in our lives, by all means, you know, you can still bulk with 500 calories as a surplus and you'll be fine. But, you know, just expect potentially more fat gain and less hypertrophy than if you were sleeping adequately. But the final thing I'll say is try not to nocebo yourself. So I know it can be very uh, disheartening to think about the fact that, oh, I'm not sleeping enough. Um, this is going to kill my gains. I think that's probably the wrong stance to take. And you can likely still make gains even when you're sleeping relatively poorly. And if anything, just getting in that activity is going to improve your sleep. It's going to improve many of your health factors. So try not to be too um, noceboed by the fact that you're not sleeping very much. That's my advice based on both the research and on my experience having had chronic insomnia. 100%. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think um, I don't think I would adjust anything because I wouldn't recommend like a super aggressive bulk in the first place. Um, the the research that I've seen doesn't suggest that going faster necessarily helps you gain more muscle. Even if you're sleeping enough, larger surpluses past a point uh, just seem to primarily lead to more fat gain. So, um, yeah, I think I think a pretty uh, like reasonable constrained surplus is what I would recommend to people who are sleeping enough. And uh, I don't like like to to the point where it's it's like yeah if you're going to significantly modify this you're just at maintenance and then the question functionally becomes if you're not sleeping a lot should you even bulk in the first place and i think like yeah if you're trying to maximize muscle growth uh you should probably be in an energy surplus whether or not you're sleeping a lot or a little so yeah still bulk and whether you're sleeping a lot or a little don't be in a enormous surplus if you want to maximize muscle growth without putting on an enormous amount of fat in the process. And I think that applies regardless of, of how much someone's sleeping. Yeah, hundred percent. And look at the end of the day with, with bulking and, and wor worrying too much about getting too fat. I think as long as you're implementing some form of uh, assessment aside from, aside from just looking at body weight changes, you know, like a circumference measurement or like you're visually assessing your, your physique, but ideally, you know, looking at waist circumference and so on and so forth, unless you're absolutely yellowing it, I, f I don't think it's very easy for you to all of a sudden get way too fat without realizing, you know, in the process. That's yeah, yeah no, I, agree. I, I agree with that. Although okay. one oh. real quick, one hot take I want to put out there and just have a uh, temperature check to see whether it's too hot or just right. Nowadays with a lot of clients, I think that intentional surpluses might be somewhat contraindicated even if their aim is to gain muscle because ultimately for many people losing weight and keeping it off is a much bigger challenge than gaining muscle and so obviously depending on many contextual factors that have to be considered the, the answer may be different but i think that for many people the bulk may be a little bit overrated in terms of cost to benefit cost being potentially gaining weight and then struggling to lose it again or having to make a huge lifestyle sacrifice with society. We live in a society um, mm -hmm. becoming increasingly obesogenic is a word that has been used to describe it, essentially just incentivizing less physical activity and facilitating the consumption of more calories more easily. Um, with that being the case, nowadays, I favor bulking a lot less than I used to just because it's difficult for people to lose that weight that they put on during the bulk that they may not want to have on versus like the slight edge in hypertrophy that they get from being a surplus. Temperature check. I am open to uh, critiques. Uh, I don't know, man. I think um, I I think for me, it just depends on like what someone's goals are. And I'm mm. I'm not going to make assumptions about that. Like, uh, like I, I honestly, like truly don't care what someone's, what someone's body composition goals are. Like if, if someone were to come to me and they're already 25% body fat and they say, Hey, I don't give a shit about seeing my abs. I don't care. I 
want to put a hundred pounds on my squat and build as much muscle as I can. Um, and I'm, I'm chill with bulking that I'm like, yeah, well let's be in a surplus, you know? Um, versus like, yeah, if, if someone does say that their, that their main goal is to like lose weight and keep it off. I, I do think that there is like a strain in some advice that people give where they say, oh, well, no, no matter what, uh, if someone's untrained, you you start with a surplus because you want to build as much muscle as you can. And that muscle is going to like dramatically increase your metabolic rate and make it way easier to lose weight after the fact. And like, no, like that's that's not the case. Um, like, I, I think that's a little silly, like recommending bulks to people who actually want to cut. <laughs> um, I, th- I think that's very silly. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if. If if someone wants, like, I, I tr- I I try to not uh, like like read my, read my own values and preferences into someone's goal. And if someone has a goal that would be best facilitated by bulking, then mm-hmm. yeah, go for it. You know. No, I hundred percent agree with that, and that's why I said like all the contextual factors obviously go into it. it has the client's goals, their preferences for body fat percentages, like all that stuff. But I just think that somewhat categorically, based on the um, the research we have on weight loss interventions and how successful slash not successful in this case they tend to be and how difficult it seems to be to maintain weight loss for a lot of people. I tend to think that if given the option and it's like a, you know, a split decision whether you bulk or maintain, I typically nowadays am more, f- I'm more inclined to have someone maintain than bulk. I guess just on, just with the rates of... Um, the rates of weight regain that you see in the research and the rates of um, the rates of successful weight loss during an intervention. So that's kind of my my stance. But I, I get where you're coming from fully. And obviously, if you're just concerned with putting on muscle, everyone should be doing go mad, gallon milk a day, blast it, a 2,000 calorie surplus. It's a good time. It's a good time. Yeah, I, I think I think one of... I, I I do think I disagree with you a little bit. Um, par- partially in reference to like which pounds or kilos is it hard to lose and keep off. Um, from what I've seen, uh, it seems to like interact a little bit with concepts of like set points or settling points where whatever someone's just kind of like normal like habitual level of adiposity is where they've been for like a few years or whatever it can be challenging to get significantly below that and keep it off long term but any like relatively new adiposity that someone accrues um it seems like people have a considerably easier time taking that off and keeping it off and so i i do kind of think that if someone does a bulk and doesn't just get like completely out of control with it. Um, they probably aren't going to struggle that much to lose weight back to more or less where they started the bulk. And then it might get more challenging to lose weight from there, but it already would have been more challenging to lose weight from there in the first place. Um, so yeah, like I, I don't see that as quite as much of a downside just because not, not, all pounds are equally difficult to take off. Yeah, no, I agree with that. The um, the only contour argument I have there is that depending on the size of the surplus and how the bulk is executed, I do think there can be the um, incorporation of habits that then make subsequent weight loss difficult. Oh, for um, sure. Like if, yeah. for example, you were you were blasting the go mad every day during your bulk, and you know you got a taste for the milk, it might be difficult to let go of it during your cut, which might make cutting difficult. Um, so yeah, I, I just think like on net balance, it may or may not be a good idea for X versus Y person, but it's um, it's definitely a no one shoe fits all sort of approach. Except yeah. the new stronger by science shoe that fits all. But uh, joking, let stronger me let science. me dot com slash coaching. <laughs> let me, yeah, true. Um, but I, I do hear what what Milo says, and it there there may be some implications for coaches. who uh, to sort of do, um, I don't know, like consider their clients' past preferences 
and, and so and behaviors that they may have noticed and then potentially adjust the surplus accordingly or be a bit more conservative because if you've worked with somebody and you've seen that oh we did the bulk and then you know they ended up being a bit more miserable and then it took them you know an extra few months to lose um, mm -hmm. some of the fat they gained like in those cases i get it but yeah this was the most uh, civilized uh, discussion with some disagreement I have ever witnessed, and it was great. That makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Fuck off, Milo. You're a fraud and a charlatan. <laughs> uh, just, just kidding. No, no, no. Uh, okay. Um, next question from the Spruce Moose. How accurate are smartwatches at tracking sleep? I've used a few and they seem to match anecdotal experience in terms of stages in wakefulness and they seem to have gotten better. Does this match anything we know from the science? I have next to no input on this, so I will I will leave you guys to take this one. Uh, so I am also it's it's out of my lane, but based on the sleep regularity data and the, the complex uh the complex R, like the R package they used in order to calculate, uh, you know, uh, sleep duration, disturbance, quality, and so on and so forth. I'd say, and from the, the few I've se the few things I've seen on, on 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 watches, I'd say they can be okay. But at the end of the day, if you're feeling rested after um, after being in bed for X amount of hours, I think that's a, a good enough indication of. Um, sleep being okay and some i i i mean okay th there are sleep apps now okay obviously the, this person is asking about smart watches but um sleep apps that use sound for example can be can be way off in terms of whether you're actually in deep sleep or not um but yeah greg any it, it, actual knowledge besides rambling and <laughs> uh i've i've got a little bit um not an enormous amount in part because this um, it's it's not an area where there's been like a ton of research attention. And mm. also when there is research, it tends to get out of date pretty quickly because, um, yeah, like there there are multiple there are multiple ways you could develop a sleep tracking app or uh, uh, hardware product or whatever. Um, and they are of varying levels of quality, uh, like, um, like Pac mentioned the ones that, that do it based on sound, eh, pretty rough. Cause if you snore, mm, you know, might, might, uh, might not be great or, um, ones that, uh, I had one, I think it was called sleep as Android for a little bit where you were supposed to put it next to you on the bed and it kind of, I think used the, the built-in accelerometer to mm -hmm. um, kind of feel movement, like how much were you moving? And if you were dead, dead still, it just assumed you were asleep. That was terrible for me because uh, nights I don't sleep well, I don't toss and turn. Like I just lay there as if I were paralyzed, but I'm not. I just don't move around like yeah, I'm laying in bed. What what am I going to what am I going to do? Like, I'm not trying to do f fucking floor calisthenics right now. Like, I'm trying to sleep. I'm not going to be moving around. So it always thought I slept way more than I actually did. Um, so, yeah, there, there is some tech that's like very, very dodgy. Um, smart watches are getting better. Um, the the ones that have um, like the sensors for looking at so like they have built-in accelerometers so like if you're moving your wrist it'll be able to tell um and they have like the sensors to look at heart rate and heart rate variability and um even some other like blood flow kinetic variables now like the the newer ones with the newer sensors and as those improve they do seem to be one just kind of like a, a priori the data they collect is like more reliably indicative of uh whether or not your sleep is a binary variable and sleep stage than the sound based ones or the like just purely movement and vibration based uh, uh apps do um like they have better sensors they get better data they should be able to make better inferences with it and and they tend to um 
And like the sensors are getting better and the detection algorithms are improving. I still think in general, they're not like super, super good yet for the most part, but I do think they are improving. Um, my understanding of the state of things as it currently exists is that the Apple Watch has kind of the best um, the best sleep tracking uh, going on. Um, and I say that not not as an Apple fanboy. I I am an Android guy. Like I said, I previously used an app called mm-hmm. Sleep as Android. I don't think you can get that on an iPhone. I still have Android, and if people get mad that I send them green texts, uh, I call them out for being classist assholes. And uh, you know, I I still use an Android like the working class hero I am. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So I I have no I have no love for the Apple Watch, and in fact, I don't like the idea of smartwatches in general. Like I I refuse to get one. They seem so dumb and annoying. But um. And if people who like smartwatches don't comment. I don't care that you like your smartwatch. You can fuck off. Like I, I genuinely, I'm happy for you. It's not my bag, baby. Uh, but as far as sleep tracking goes, my understanding is that the Apple Watch isn't perfect yet, not anywhere close. But it, it is probably the best consumer product uh, out there for tracking sleep. Yeah. So. Just to quickly touch on some literature very quickly, without obviously, as, as the, the listener can tell, this was an, an in-depth look, but this is a recent, uh, recent study, well, recent review actually from 20, uh, 23, accuracy of 11 wearable, uh, nearable and airable consumer sleep trackers, prospective multi-center validation study, uh, where essentially they um, assess the accuracy of 11 of those sleep trackers uh, against uh, polysom- polysomnography. Uh, i.e. the gold standard for uh, sleep studies. They looked at Google Pixel Watch, Galaxy Watch, Fitbit Sense 2, Apple Watch 8, um, uh, Aura Ring 3, um, and a c- bunch of other devices. They had 75 participants from a hospital in Korea, and they looked at over for th- over 3,800 3, hours of sleep. Anyways, without diving too much in the details, they found that uh, significant variation in sleep stage classification uh, accuracy was noted among the trackers. Um, They showed a high proportional bias in sleep efficiency, um, and that was for the wearables specifically, so for the watches, and nearables uh, exhibited high bias in sleep latency, which led to the authors concluding that some trackers demonstrated substantial agreement with uh, polysomnography showing potential for sleep monitoring however the accuracy varied significantly and yeah pretty much what you said like you actually guess you're you're that advanced that you're able to predict the literature without knowing the literature cool uh i I mean yeah that, that one of the things you mentioned is worth noting as well there um they're generally better for uh, total sleep time than sleep efficiency or uh, um, uh, sleep stages. I mean, like they're my, my understanding is that for um, being able to tell if you're in stage one or stage two or uh, deep sleep or REM or whatever. My understanding is that even the best consumer grade products are still pretty rough when it comes to that. Um Although, although generally improving, but uh, sleep sleep duration, they're they're getting better at. Yeah, yeah. And what I was going to mention regarding polysomnography as being the kind of gold standard for assessing sleep duration, sleep quality, all that. I actually underwent one uh, as part of my chronic insomnia assessment. Would not recommend if you're looking to track your total sleep duration, quality, etc. It is not a comfortable process. You essentially put a bunch of electrodes on your head and have like a net around your hair. And it certainly doesn't help with increasing sleep duration or quality, I can tell you that. Um, so even if it's a bit less accurate, I would still use a uh, a smartwatch or a ring or what have you as a more practical option. Yeah. I personally track, I've been tracking sleep for seven years using one of these apps on the phone, but I don't pay attention much to uh, to the quality readings uh, or the time of sleep, I just 
want to track my time in bed and my sleep regularity. And as long as time in bed is eight plus hours and sleep regularity is like above 80, 85 percent, I'm good. Because uh, especially with a sound one, like it's it's just off. Anywho's, I kind of asked you the, the the next question because it's for you specifically, Greg. It seems to be some uh, sort sort of no. Sh- sure. Yeah. Go for it. Okay, so it's by Mount Swolympus. It says, how does one raw dog sleep? I've been sleeping with protection for the last couple of years. Is this a, an inside joke? Uh, it's a reference to something I said in the last episode uh, about not using an eye mask or earplugs. Um, oh. Yeah. Uh, ah. Yeah, you just go go to sleep without an eye mask or your plugs bummer i thought it was it was some reference to some other episode and i was like oh okay this will no, be funny you, you were here you were here i was here adhd card it's greek it's fine passport I, card i wouldn't English pay bad. that much attention to most things i say either it's we totally fine no judgment i'm gonna get the whole transcript and everything you said tattooed now to make sure there's no bad blood absolutely okay uh Last question to to end off this episode by Brian Sip, Brian Kip. Uh, literally, how does the body flip the switch from awake to sleeping? Is it a hormone release cascade, a nerve impulse, a chemical reaction, etc.? Like your muscles contract because of a nerve impulse from the brain down the spinal cord to the muscle, which causes actin and myosin proteins to interact, etc. So, what causes sleep? As we alluded to before the episode began, uh, we are nowhere near qualified to properly answer that question. However, it seems to be a multitude of different variables. Keep in mind, these are just off the back of just Googling the question itself, not legit knowledge, but circadian rhythm um, and and melatonin uh, obviously play an important role. So if your body's used to going to bed at a certain time, that will affect it. Um, Adenosine buildup, as well as changes in brain activity. But uh, I remember you, Greg, you mentioned a couple more things that I am am not uh, missing out on. It just seems to be a lot of different, uh, a range of physiological mechanisms, hormonal changes, nerve impulses, chemical reactions. uh, But it all seems to be coordinated primarily by the brain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have too much to add to that. Um, it is, I mean, you know, for this, this is, I think one of the, one of the challenging things about, um, about communicating about biological sciences in general, because there are some things that are very simple and there are some things that are extremely not simple. Um, and yeah, so like a an example here is um, let's see a, a good a good example I believe is like the um, the Human Genome Project and the excitement that people had about that back in the '90s because prior to that we didn't know that much about genetics but we knew a bit and. The stuff we had found was very interesting and it made it seem like a lot of things were kind of like caused by issues with one gene. And once we unravel the genome, uh, we'll be able to enter like a Gattaca-esque world where we can just like change one gene here or there and have like big, uh, big outcomes on or big effects on phenotype. Because a lot of the stuff that was known about was um, stuff like sickle cell trait, for instance, where it's just like a single like nucleotide uh, error in encoding for the hemoglobin protein. And so there's just like an issue with one gene. And if that could be fixed, hey, we don't have sickle cell anymore, you know? Um, And so people kind of thought that that's how genetics worked. And we unraveled the genome and we, we now have the blueprint to our body and everything going on. And then as soon as we learned more about genetics, we realized like, Oh, yeah, most stuff is like super polygenic. And um, even when you have huge databases of outcomes of interest and genetic info, um, there might be like 40 genes across your genome that are associated with some 
phenotype of interest, but a lot of those will be false positives. And even if you added up like all of the contributions of all of them, you can explain like 8% of the variance in the trait of interest. And so then it's like, oh, okay, this, this is way more complex than we thought it was. And, um, yeah, I, I do think, and I, I'm not necessarily saying Brian is doing this, but I do think there is a, uh, a tendency to want biology to be simple and for things to have like a direct known, relatively simple, straightforward mechanistic cause where there is, there is one, one thing that happens and it leads to an outcome. And I think, I think that it's like, I think that this is analogically quite similar to uh, the human genome project and how much more complex we found out genetics was uh, something like muscle contraction is, is I think more complex than people realize. Um, you know, there, there are things that happen upstream of that nerve impulse that's delivered to the muscles. There are plenty of things that happen downstream of the nerve impulse reaching the muscle and the muscle actually contracting. Like there are a lot of steps in that process, but as far as complex, like, or organisms, like, like things going on in your body that you can actually like see with your visible eye, um, kind of like macro things your body is doing. Uh, muscle contraction is one of the simpler ones. Like you're, you're, mo you're moving a whole ass limb and you can characterize that pathway relatively well and, and pretty straightforwardly, fairly simple, makes sense. Um, but a lot of the stuff your body does is just like a lot more complex than that. Um, especially when you start dealing with, uh, you know, issues of like cognition and like conscious perception, which, you know, when you're talking about sleep, it, it's how do, how are you transitioning from kind of you're, you're there and then you're not there, you know? Um, like that's, that's, it's, it's not fully understood and it is, there, there are just like more like multivariate and complex causes than muscle contraction. Um, if there wasn't, uh, we would have like really good sleep drugs. Like if, if it was just like, there is one thing that governs sleep and wakefulness and it's relatively straightforward. Um, you could just take a pill that was whatever protein or whatever hormone or whatever, uh, switched off the light and made you go from awake to asleep. But anyone who's had to take sleep drugs can probably attest to this. Um, it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> you know, like they might make you like a little bit delirious. Sometimes they, they take you out. Sometimes they don't like it can be in, uh, there, there are multiple ones because it's not like super straightforward where it's just like one thing works. Bada beam, bada boom. Good to go. Um, so yeah, I, it is of those things that that he listed. Is it a hormone release cascade, nerve impulses, chemical reaction? Yes, to all of the above. Um, seems to have something to do with melatonin. Seems to have something to do with adenosine. Seems to have something to do with GABA, um, and probably fifty other things. And uh, yeah, it's not fully characterized yet, but. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot going on. It's not something where there is just like a simple A to B to C kind of direct mechanistic uh, link from being awake to being asleep. Greg, on top of exposing your actually a napping expert, I'm going to expose you for one more thing. You missed out on one very simple piece of reading that could have explained all this. It's titled Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. <laughs> it actually answers the whole question that was just posed and... You could have just referred the listener to this, but instead you uh, went off on some mumbo jumbo sentence about how it's not actually that simple. Yeah, uh, we we did we did this shit post in in the last episode. This is this is a lazy callback, Milo. Hashtag be better. I am sorry. <laughs> I apologize. At least you remembered. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Does I think that's anyone... all the questions. Right. It is. Yeah. I was going to ask if anyone had any any closing thoughts or feelings about sleep or anything you know or find interesting about sleep that we haven't covered in this series uh, or just any any final closing thoughts. Pack, go first. 
I would say I would urge people to give uh, a sleeping mask by uh, by a, like a high highly ranked one from Amazon. Give that a go if you are having issues with your sleep and earplugs, especially foam ones, um, are worth a try. I know it sounds like one of those weird things that most people are like, I don't want to put something in my ear when I sleep. But um, I do believe that for some, it may be one of those, oh, wow, eureka moments where it actually helps their sleep. Other than that, just, hey, make sure to get your regular night's sleep in and don't sweat the details that much. So I know some people watch TV when falling asleep. I'm now assuming that people also listen to podcasts while falling asleep. If you're still here and you're trying to fall asleep, I am sorry. Uh, I hope you will fall asleep soon and you can listen to another podcast and get to sleep. On a more serious note, I, I think that you probably don't need to be too concerned about your sleep duration for health, as long as it's not entirely ridiculous like i'm talking under six hours consistently or what have you and for extended periods of time i'm talking years and years and years likewise with um inconsistent sleep patterns unless you're having years and years and years of inconsistent sleep patterns it's probably not going to meaningfully impact your health for sort of more exercise related stuff if you are sleeping poorly, do still try and make an effort to get some exercise in because it will ameliorate many of the outcomes you care about, whether it's health, hypertrophy, or potentially even future sleep. So take the exercise pill. Don't worry too much about short-term disruptions in sleep. And that is essentially it. Okay, I think that does it for this episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. Uh, thanks again to everyone that listened. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. We hope you got something of value out of it. And uh, yeah, if you're if you're currently trying to go to sleep, uh, I will say we did our best. We tried to use our smoothest and most dulcet and relaxing tones <laughs> and uh, run the episode long enough that you would have plenty of time to power your brain down. But if we didn't succeed, there's there's a long back catalog. I'm sure you can find something else to to finish you off. Um, but yeah, thanks. Thanks for listening. Uh, we'll talk to you again in another couple of weeks uh, when we're back again with another great episode. All right. Bye, everyone. Peace.